Dramatis Personae of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne Boleyn, Catherine's Maid of Honor, afterwards Queen, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Archbishop Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, read by Martin Geeson. Bishop Lincoln, read by Dale Burgess. Brandon, read by Algie Pug. Capucius, ambassador from the Emperor Charles V, read by Algie Pug. Cardinal Campeius, read by Lars Rolander. Cardinal Wolsey, read by Bruce Peary. Chorus, read by Ruth Golding. Crier, read by Iswa. Cromwell, Servant to Wolsey, read by Dale Burgess. Dr. Butts, Physician to the King, read by Matthew Rees. Duke of Buckingham, read by Peter Bishop. Duke of Norfolk, read by John Fricker. The Duke of Suffolk, read by Elizabeth Clett. Earl of Surrey, read by Tricia G. First Gentleman, read by Larry Womack. First Secretary to Wolsey, read by Amy Graymore. Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, read by Michael Erskins. Garter, King at Arms, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Gentleman, read by Paul Andrews. Griffith, Gentleman Usher to Queen Catherine, read by Rick F. Henry the Eighth, read by Algie Pug. The Keeper, read by Paul Andrews. Lord Abergavenny, read by Paul Andrews. Lord Chamberlain, read by Matthew Rees. Lord Chancellor, read by Jason Bortles. Lord Sands, read by Timothy Ferguson. Man, the Porter's Man, read by David Lawrence. Messenger. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Old Lady. Read by Rashada. Page. A Page to Gardener. Read by Roseanne Schmidt. Patience. Woman to Queen Catherine. Read by Ruth Golding. Porter. Doorkeeper of the Council Chamber. Read by Algie Pug. Queen Catherine. Wife to King Henry. Afterwards divorced. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Scribe. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. The Second Gentleman. Read by Amy Graymore. Sergeant. Read by Ernst Patinama. Servant. Read by Anna. Sir Anthony Denny. Read by Ernst Patinama. Sir Henry Guilford. Read by Martin Geeson. Sir Nicholas Vaux, read by Algie Pug. Sir Thomas Lovell, read by Paul Adams. Surveyor to the Duke of Buckingham, read by Amy. Third Gentleman, read by Vegegrower. A Voice Within, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Song, Act Three, Scene One, sung by Iswa. Accompaniment by Algie Pug. Narrator read by Tricia G. End of Dramatis Personae. Act One of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare, Act One, Prologue. I come no more to make you laugh. Things now that bear a weighty and a serious brow, sad, high, and working, full of state and woe, such noble scenes as draw the eye to flow, we now present. Those that can pity. Here may, if they think it well, let fall a tear, 
the subject will deserve it. Such as give their money out of hope they may believe may here find truth too. Those that come to see only a show or two, and so agree the play may pass if they be still and willing, I'll undertake may see away their shilling richly in two short hours. Only they that come to hear a merry, bawdy play, a noise of targets, or to see a fellow in a long motley coat guarded with yellow, will be deceived. For gentle hearers know, to rank our chosen truth with such a show as fool and fight is, beside forfeiting our own brains and the opinion that we bring to make that only true we now intend will leave us never an understanding friend therefore for goodness sake and as you are known the first and happiest hearers of the town be sad as we would make ye think ye see the very persons of our noble story as they were living Think you see them great, and followed with the general throng and sweat of thousand friends. Then, in a moment, see how soon this mightiness meets misery. And if you can be merry then, I'll say, a man may weep upon his wedding day. Act One, Scene One, London, an antechamber in the palace. Enter Norfolk at one door, at the other Buckingham and Abergavenny. Good morrow, and well met. How have ye done since we last saw in France? I thank your grace, healthful, and ever since a fresh admirer of what I saw there. An untimely ague stayed me a prisoner in my chamber when those sons of glory, those two lights of men, met in the Vale of Andron. Twixt Gynes and Ard, I was then present, saw them salute on horseback, beheld them when they lighted, how they clung in their embracement as they grew together, which had they what four-throned ones could have weighed, such a compounded one? All the whole time I was my chamber's prisoner. Then you lost the view of earthly glory. Men might say, till this time Pomp was single, but now married, to one above itself. Each following day became the next day's master, till the last made former wonders its, Today the French, all cliquant, told in gold like heathen gods, shone down the English, and tomorrow they made Britain India. Every man that stood showed like a mine. Their dwarfish pages were as cherubins, all gilt. The madams, too, not used to toil, did almost sweat to bear the pride upon them, that their very labour was to them as a painting. Now this mask was cried incomparable, and the insuring knight made it a fool and beggar. The two kings, equal in lustre, were now best, now worst, as presents did present them. Him in I, still him in praise, and being present both, t'was said that they saw but one, and no discerner durst wag his tongue in censure. When these sons, for so they phrase them, by their heralds challenge the noble spirits to arms, they did perform beyond thought's compass, that former fabulous story being now seen possible enough, got credit that Beavis was believed. Oh, you go far. As I belong to worship and affect in honour honesty, the tract of every thing would by a good discourse lose some life, which action's self was tongue to. All was royal. To the disposing of it naught rebelled. Order gave each thing view. The office did distinctly his full function. Who did guide? I mean, who set the body and the limbs of this great sport together, as you guess? One certs that promises no element in such a business. I pray you, who, my lord? All this was ordered by the good discretion of the right reverend Cardinal of York. The devil speed him. No man's pie is freed from his ambitious finger. What had he to do in these fierce vanities? I wonder that such a keech can, with his very bulk, take up the rays of the beneficial sun and keep it from the earth. Surely, sir. There's in him stuff that puts him to these ends, for, being not propped by ancestry, whose grace chalks successes their way, nor called upon for high feats done to the crown, neither allied for eminent assistance, but spider-like, out of his self-drawing web he gives us note. The force of his own merit makes his way, a gift that heaven gives for him, which buys a place next to the king. 
I cannot tell what heaven hath given him. Let some graver eye pierce into that. But I can see his pride peep through each part of him. When says he that, if not from hell? The devil is a niggard, or has given all before, and he begins a new hell in himself. Why the devil, upon this French going out, took he upon him, without the privy o' the king, to appoint who should attend on him? He makes up the file of all the gentry, for the most part such to whom as great a charge as little honour he meant to lay upon, and his own letter, the honourable board of council out, must fetch him in the papers. I do know kinsmen of mine, three at the least, that have by this so sickened their estates that never they shall abound as formerly. Oh, many have broke their backs with laying manners on them for this great journey. What did this vanity but minister communication of a most poor issue? Grievingly, I think, the peace between the French and us not values the cost that did conclude it. Every man, after the hideous storm that followed, was a thing inspired, and, not consulting, broke into a general prophecy, that this tempest, dashing the garment of this peace, aboded the sudden breach on Which is budded out, for France hath floored the league, and hath touched our merchants' good at Bordeaux. Is it, therefore, the ambassador is silenced? Marry ist. A proper title of a peace, and purchased at a superfluous rate. Why, all this business our reverend cardinal carried. Like it, your grace, the state takes notice of the private difference betwixt you and the cardinal. I advise you, and take it from a heart that wishes towards you honour and plenteous safety, that you read the cardinal's malice and his potency together, to consider further that what his hatred would affect wants not a minister in his power. You know his nature, that he's revengeful. And I know his sword hath a sharp edge. It's long, and, may be said, it reaches far, and well twill not extend thither he darts it. Bosom up thy counsel. You'll find it wholesome. Lo, no, where comes that rock that I advise your shunning? Enter Cardinal Wolsey, the purse borne before him, certain of the guard, and two secretaries with papers. Cardinal Wolsey in his passage fixeth his eye on Buckingham, and Buckingham on him, both full of disdain. The Duke of Buckingham's surveyor, huh? Where's his examination? Here, so please you. Is he in person ready? Aye, please your grace. Well, we shall then know more, and Buckingham shall lessen this big look. Exeunt Cardinal Wolsey and his train. This butcher's cur is venom-mouthed, and I have not the power to muzzle him. Therefore best not wake him in his slumber. A beggar's book outworths a noble's blood. What? Are you chafed? Ask God for temperance. That's the appliance only which your disease requires. I read in's look matter against me, and his eye reviled me as his abject object. At this instant he bores me with some trick. He's gone to the king. I'll follow and outstare him. Stay, my lord, and let your reason with your collar question what tis you go about. To climb steep hills requires slow pace at first. Anger is like a full hot horse, who being allowed his way self-metal tires him. Not a man in England can advise me like you. Be to yourself as you would to your friend. I'll to the king, and from a mouth of honour quite cry down this Ipswich fellow's insolence, or proclaim there's difference in no persons. Be advised. Heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. We may outrun by violent swiftness that which we run at, and lose by overrunning. Know you not the fire that mounts the liquor till run o'er, in seeming to augment it wastes it? Be advised. I say again, there is no English soul more stronger to direct you than yourself, if with the sap of reason you would quench or but allay the fire of passion. Sir, I am thankful to you, and I'll go along by your prescription, but this top-proud fellow, whom from the flow of gall I name not but from sincere motions, by intelligence, and proofs as clear as founts in July when we see each grain of gravel, I do know to be corrupt and treasonous. Say not treasonous. To the king I'll say it, and make my vouch as strong as shore of rock. Attend, this holy fox, or wolf, or both, for he is equal ravenous as he is subtle, and as prone to mischief as able to perform. 
his mind and place infecting one another, yea, reciprocally, only to show his pomp as well in France as here at home, suggests the king, our master, to this last costly treaty, the interview that swallowed so much treasure, and like a glass did break ere the rinsing. Faith, and so it did. Pray, give me favour, sir. This cunning cardinal, the articles or the combination, drew as himself pleased, and they were ratified as he cried, Thus let be, to as much end as give a crutch to the dead. But our Count Cardinal has done this, and tis well, for worthy Wolsey, who cannot err, he did it. Now this follows, which, as I take it, is a kind of puppy to the old dam, treason, Charles the Emperor, under pretence to see the Queen his aunt, for twas indeed his colour, but he came to whisper Wolsey, here make visitation. His fears were that the interview betwixt England and France might, through their amity, breed him some prejudice, for from this league peeped harms that menaced him. He privily deals with our cardinal, and, as I trow, which I do well, for I am sure the emperor paid ere he promised, whereby his suit was granted ere it was asked, but when the way was made and paved with gold, the emperor thus desired that he would please to alter the king's course and break the foresaid peace. Let the king know, as soon as he shall by me, that thus the cardinal does buy and sell his honour as he pleases, and for his own advantage. I am sorry to hear this of him, and could wish he were something mistaken in't. No, not a syllable. I do pronounce him in that very shape he shall appear in proof. Enter Brandon, a sergeant-at-arms before him, and two or three of the guard. Your office, sergeant. Execute it. Sir, my lord, the Duke of Buckingham, and Earl of Hereford, Stafford, and Northampton, I arrest thee of high treason, in the name of our most sovereign king. Lo, you, my lord, the net hath fallen upon me. I shall perish under device and practice. I am sorry to see you taken from liberty, to look on the business present. Tis his highness pleasure you shall to the tower. It will help me nothing to plead mine innocence, for that die is on me which makes my whitest part black. The will of heaven be done in this and all things. I obey, O oh my lord Abergavenny, fare you well. Nay, he must bear you company. To Abergavenny. The king is pleased you shall to the tower, till you know how he determines further. As the duke said, the will of heaven be done, and the king's pleasure by me obeyed. Here is a warrant from the king to attach Lord Montacute, and the bodies of the duke's confessor, John de la Carre, one Gilbert Peck, his chancellor. So, so, these are the limbs of the plot, no more, I hope. A monk of the Chartreux. Oh, Nicholas Hopkins? He. My surveyor is false. The old great cardinal hath showed him gold. My life is spanned already. I am the shadow of poor Buckingham, whose figure even this instant cloud puts on, by darkening my clear sun. My lord, farewell. Exeunt. Scene two. The same. The council chamber. Cornets. Enter King Henry the Eighth, leaning on Cardinal Wolsey's shoulder, the nobles and Lavelle. Cardinal Wolsey places himself under King Henry the Eighth's feet on his right side. My life itself, and the best heart of it, thanks you for this great care. I stood in the level of a full-charged confederacy, and give thanks to you that choked it. Let me call before us that gentleman of Buckingham's. In person I'll hear him his confessions justify, and point by point the treasons of his master he shall again relate. A noise within, crying, Room for the Queen! Enter Queen Catherine, ushered by Norfolk and Suffolk. She kneels. King Henry the Eighth riseth from his state, takes her up, kisses and placeth her by him. Nay, we must longer kneel. I am a suitor. Arise, and take place by us. Half your suit never name to us. You have half our power. The other moiety, ere you ask, is given. Repeat your will and take it. Thank your majesty. 
That you would love yourself, and in that love not unconsidered leave your honour, nor the dignity of your office is the point of my petition. Lady mine, proceed. I am solicited, not by a few, and those of true condition, that your subjects are in great grievance. There have been commissions sent down among them, which hath flawed the heart of all their loyalties wherein although my good lord cardinal they vent reproaches most bitterly on you as putter on of these exactions yet the king our master whose honour heaven shield from soil even he escapes not language unmannerly yea such which breaks the sides of loyalty and almost appears in loud rebellion not almost appears it doth appear for upon these taxations the clothiers all, not able to maintain the many to them longing, have put off the spinsters, carters, fullers, weavers, who, unfit for other life, compelled by hunger and lack of other means, in desperate manner, daring the event to the teeth, are all in uproar, and danger serves among them. Taxation! Wherein? And what taxation? My lord cardinal, you that are blamed for it alike with us, know you of this taxation? Please you, sir, I know but of a single part in aught pertains to the state, and front but in that file where others tell steps with me. No, my lord, you know no more than others, but you frame things that are known alike, which are not wholesome to those which would not know them, and yet must perforce be their acquaintance. These exactions, whereof my sovereign would have note, they are most pestilent to the bearing, and to bear em the back is sacrifice to the load. They say they are devised by you, or else you suffer too hard an exclamation. Still exaction, the nature of it, in what kind, let's know, is this exaction? I am much too venturous in tempting of your patience, but am boldened under your promised pardon. The subject's grief comes through commissions, which compel from each the sixth part of his substance to be levied without delay. And the pretense for this is named your wars in France. This makes bold mouths, tongues spit their duties out, and cold hearts freeze allegiance in them. Their curses now live where their prayers did. And it's come to pass this tractable obedience is a slave to each insensate will. I would your highness would give it quick consideration, for there is no primer business. By my life, this is against our pleasure. And for me I have no further gone in this than by a single voice, and that not past me but by learned approbation of the judges. If I am traduced by ignorant tongues which neither know my faculties nor person, yet will be the chronicles of my doing, let me say tis but the fate of place and the rough break that virtue must go through. We must not stint our necessary actions in the fear to cope malicious censurers, which ever, as ravenous fishes do a vessel follow that is new trimmed, but benefit no further than vainly longing. What we oft do best, by sick interpreters, once weak ones, is not ours or not allowed. What worst, as oft, hitting a grosser quality, is cried up for our best act. If we shall stand still, in fear our motion will be mocked or carped at, we should take root here where we sit, or sit state statues only. Things well done, and with a care, exempt themselves from fear. Things done without example, in their issue, are to be feared. Have you a precedent of this commission? I believe not any. We must not rend our subjects from our laws and stick them in our will. Sixth part of each. A trembling contribution. Why we take from every tree, lop, bark, and part of the timber. And though we leave it with a root, thus hacked, the air will drink the sap. To every county where this is questioned, send our letters, with free pardon to each man that hath denied the force of this commission. Pray, look to it. I put it to your care. A word with you. To the secretary. Let there be letters writ to every shire of the king's grace and pardon. 
the grieved commons hardly conceive of me let it be noised that through our intercession this revocement and pardon comes i shall anon advise you further in the proceeding exit secretary enter surveyor i am sorry that the duke of buckingham is run in your displeasure it grieves many the gentleman is learned and a most rare speaker to nature none more bound his training such that he may furnish and instruct great teachers and never seek aid out of himself yet see when these so noble benefits shall prove not well disposed the mind growing once corrupt they turn to vicious forms ten times more ugly than ever they were fair this man so complete who is enrolled amongst wonders and when we almost with ravished listening could not find his hour of speech a minute he my lady hath into monstrous habits put the graces that once were his and is become as black as if besmeared in hell sit by us you shall hear this was his gentleman in trust of him things to strike honour sad bid him recount the four recited practices whereof we cannot feel too little hear too much stand forth and with bold spirit relate what you most like a careful subject have collected out of the duke of buckingham speak freely first it was usual with him every day would infect his speech that if the king should without issue die he'll carry it so to make the sceptre his these very words i've heard him utter to his son-in-law lord abergavenny to whom by oath he menaced revenge upon the cardinal please your highness note this dangerous conception in this point not friended by his wish to your high person his will is most malignant and it stretches beyond you to your friends my learned lord cardinal deliver all with charity speak on how grounded he is titled to the crown upon our fail to this point hast thou heard him at any time speak aught he was brought to this by a vain prophecy of nicholas hopkins what was that hopkins sir a chartreuse friar his confessor who fed him every minute with words of sovereignty how knowst thou this not long before your highness sped to france the duke being at the rose within the parish st lawrence poultney did of me demand what was the speech among the londoners concerning the french journey i replied men feared the french would prove perfidious to the king's danger presently the duke said twas the fear indeed and that he doubted twould prove the verity of certain words spoke by a holy monk that oft says he hath sent to me wishing me to permit john de la carre my chaplain a choice hour to hear from him a matter of some moment whom after under the confession seal he solemnly had sworn that what he spoke my chaplain to no creature living but to me should utter with demure confidence that pausingly ensued neither the king nor his heirs tell you the duke shall prosper bid him strive to gain the love o oh, the commonalty the duke shall govern england if i know you well you were the duke surveyor and lost your office on the complaint of the tenants take good heed you charge not in your spleen a noble person and spoil your nobler soul i say take heed yes heartily beseech you let him on go forward on my soul i'll speak but truth i told my lord the duke by the devil's illusions the monk might be deceived and that twas dangerous for him to ruminate on this so far until it forged him some design which being believed it was much like to do he answered tush it can do me no damage adding further that had the king in his last sickness failed the cardinals and sir thomas lavelle's heads should have gone off Ah. What? So rank? Aha! There's mischief in this man. Canst thou say further? I can, my liege. Proceed. Being at Greenwich, after your highness had reproved the duke about Sir William Blomer, I remember of such a time. Being my sworn servant, the duke retained him his. But on, what hence? If, quoth he, I for this had been committed, as to the tower I thought, I would have played the part my father meant to act upon, the usurper Richard, who, being at Salisbury, made suit to come in's presence, which, if granted, as he made semblance of his duty, would have put his knife to him. A giant traitor! 
now madam may his highness live in freedom and this man out of prison god mend all there's something more would out of thee what sayst after the duke his father with the knife he stretched him and with one hand on his dagger another spread on his breast mounting his eyes he did discharge a horrible oath whose tenor was where he evil used, he would outgo his father by as much as a performance, does an irresolute purpose. There's his period to sheath his knife in us. He is attached. Call him to present trial. If he may find mercy in the law, tis his. If none, let him not seek it of us. By day and night he's traitor to the height. Accent. Scene three. An antechamber in the palace. Enter Chamberlain and Sands. Is it possible the spells of friends should juggle men into such strange mysteries? New customs, though they be never so ridiculous, nay, let him be unmanly, yet are followed. As far as I see, all the good our English have got by the late voyage is but merely a fit or two of the face. But they are shrewd ones, for when they hold em you would swear directly their very noses had been counsellors to Pepin or Clotharius. They keep state so. They have all new legs, and lame ones, one would take it, that never saw em pace before, the spavin or springholt reigned among em. Death. My lord, their clothes are after such a pagan cut, too, that sure they've worn out Christendom. Enter Laval. How now? What news, Sir Thomas Lovell? Faith, my lord, I hear of none but the new proclamation that's clapped upon the court gate. What is it for? The reformation of our travelled gallants that fill the court with quarrels, talk, and tailors. I'm glad tis there. Now I would pray our messieurs to think an English courtier may be wise, and never see the Louvre. They must either, for so run the conditions, leave those remnants of fall and feather that they've got in France, with all their honourable point of ignorance pertaining thereunto, as fights and fireworks, abusing better men than they can be, out of a foreign wisdom, renouncing clean the faith they have in tennis and tall stockings, short blistered breeches and those types of travel, and understand again like honest men, or pack to their old playfellows. There, I take it they may, cum privilegio, wear away the lag end of their lewdness, and be laughed at. Tis time to give em physic, their diseases are grown so catching. What a loss our ladies will have of these trim vanities. Ay, marry, there will be woe indeed, lords. The sly whore sons have got a speeding trick to lay down ladies. A French song and a fiddle has no fellow. The devil fiddle em. I am glad they are going for... Sure, there's no converting of em. Now, an honest country lord, as I am, beaten a long time out of play, may bring his plain song and have an hour of hearing, and, by our lady, held current music too. Well said, Lord Sands, your colt's tooth is not cast yet. No, my lord, nor shall not, while I have a stump. Sir Thomas, whither were you a-going? To the cardinals. Your lordship is a guest too. Oh, tis true, this night he makes a supper, and a great one, to many lords and ladies. There will be the beauty of this kingdom, I'll assure you. That churchman bears a bounteous mind indeed, a hand as fruitful as the land that feeds us. His dues fall everywhere. No doubt he's noble. He had a black mouth that said other of him. He may, my lord, has wherewithal. In him sparing would show a worse sin than ill doctrine. Men of his way should be most liberal. They are set here for examples. True, they are so. But few now give so great ones. My barge stays. Your lordship shall along. Come, good Sir Thomas, we shall be late else, which I would not be, for I was spoke to with Sir Henry Guildford this night to be comptrollers. I am your lordship's. Exeunt. Scene four. A hall in York Palace. Hot boys, a small table under a state for Cardinal Wolsey, a longer table for the guests. Then enter Anne and divers other ladies and gentlemen as guests at one door. At another door enter Guildford. Ladies, a general welcome from his grace salutes ye all. 
this night he dedicates to fair content and you none here he hopes in all this noble bevy has brought with her one care abroad he would have all as merry as first good company good wine good welcome can make good people oh my lord you're tardy enter chamberlain sands and lavelle <laughs> the very thought of this fair company clapped wings to me you are young sir henry guildford sir thomas lovell had the cardinal but half my lay thoughts in him some of these should find a running banquet ere they rested i think would better please em by my life they are a sweet society of fair ones oh that your lordship were but now confessor to one or two of these i would i were they should find easy penance faith how easy as easy as a down bed would afford it sweet ladies will it please you sit sir harry place you that side i'll take charge of this his grace is entering nay you must not freeze two women placed together makes cold weather my lord sands you are one will keep em waking pray sit between these ladies by my faith and thank your lordship by your leave sweet ladies if i chance to talk a little wild forgive me i had it from my father was he mad sir oh very mad exceeding mad in love too but he would bite none just as i do now he would kiss you twenty with a breath kisses her well said my lord so now you're fairly seated gentlemen the penance lies on you if these fair ladies pass away frowning for my little cure let me alone hot boys enter cardinal wolsey and takes his state you're welcome my fair guests that noble lady or gentleman that is not freely merry is not my friend this to confirm my welcome and to you all good health drinks your grace is noble let me have such a bowl may hold my thanks and save me so much talking my lord sands i am beholding to you cheer your neighbours ladies you are not merry gentlemen whose fault is this the red wine first must rise in their fair cheeks my lord then we shall have em talk us to silence you are a merry gamester my lord sands yes if i make my play is to your ladyship and pledge it madam for tis such a thing you cannot show me i told your grace they would talk anon drum and trumpet chambers discharged what's that look out there some of ye exit servant what warlike voice and to what end is this nay ladies fear not by all the laws of war you're privileged re-enter servant how now what is it a noble troop of strangers for so they seem they've left the barge and landed and hither make as great ambassadors from foreign princes good lord chamberlain go give him welcome you can speak the french tongue and pray receive him nobly and conduct him into our presence where this heaven of beauty shall shine at full upon them some attend him exit chamberlain attended all rise and tables removed you have now a broken banquet but we'll mend it a good digestion to you all and once more i shower a welcome on ye welcome all hot boys enter king henry the eighth and others as maskers habited like shepherds ushered by the chamberlain they pass directly before cardinal wolsey and gracefully salute him a noble company what are their pleasures because they speak no english thus they prayed to tell your grace that having heard by fame of this so noble and so fair assembly this night to meet here they could do no less out of the great respect they bear to beauty but leave their flocks and under your fair conduct crave leave to view these ladies and entreat an hour of revels with them say lord chamberlain they have done my poor house grace for which i pay em a thousand thanks and pray em take their pleasures they choose ladies for the dance king henry the eighth chooses anne the fairest hand i ever touched o oh, beauty till thou i never knew thee music dance my lord 
your grace pray tell em thus much from me there should be one amongst em by his person more worthy this place than myself to whom if i but knew him with my love and duty i would surrender it i will my lord whispers the maskers what say they such a one they all confess there is indeed which they would have your grace find out and he will take it let me see then by all your good leaves gentlemen here i'll make my royal choice ye have found him cardinal unmasking you hold a fair assembly you do well lord you are a churchman or i'll tell you cardinal i should judge now unhappily i am glad your grace is grown so pleasant my lord chamberlain prithee come hither what fair lady's that an it please your grace sir thomas bullen's daughter the viscount richmond one of her highness's women by heaven she is a dainty one sweetheart i were unmanly to take you out and not to kiss you a health gentlemen let it go round sir thomas lovell is the banquet ready in the privy chamber yes my lord your grace i fear with dancing is a little heated i fear too much there's fresher air my lord in the next chamber lead in your ladies every one sweet partner i must not yet forsake you let's be merry good my lord cardinal i have half a dozen healths to drink to these fair ladies and a measure to lead em once again and then let's dream who's best in favour let the music knock it exeunt with trumpets end of act one Act Two of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Henry the Eighth, Act Two, Scene One, Westminster, a street. Enter two gentlemen meeting. Whither away so fast? Oh, God save ye, even to the hall, to hear what shall become of the great Duke of Buckingham. I'll save you that labour, sir. All's now done but the ceremony of bringing back the prisoner. Were you there? Yes, indeed was I. Pray, speak, what has happened? You may guess quickly what. Is he found guilty? Yes, truly is he, and condemned upon it. I am sorry for it. So are a number more. But pray, how passed it? I'll tell you in a little. The great duke came to the bar, where to his accusations he pleaded still not guilty, and alleged many sharp reasons to defeat the law. The king's attorney, on the contrary, urged on the examinations, proofs, confessions of divers witnesses, which the duke desired to have brought viva voce to his face, at which appeared against him his surveyor, Sir Gilbert Peck, his chancellor, and John Carr, confessor to him, with that devil monk Hopkins that made this mischief. That was he that fed him with his prophecies? The same. All these accused him strongly, which he fain would have flung from him, but indeed he could not. And so his peers, upon this evidence, have found him guilty of high treason. Much he spoke and learnedly for life, but all was either pitied in him or forgotten. After all this, how did he bear himself? When he was brought again to the bar, to hear his nail rung out as judgment, he was stirred with such an agony, his sweat extremely, and something spoke in choler, ill and hasty. But he fell to himself again, and sweetly and all the rest showed a most noble patience. I do not think he fears death. Sure he does not. He never was so womanish. The cause he may a little grieve at. Certainly the cardinal is the end of this. Tis likely by all conjectures. First Kildare's attainder, then deputy of Ireland, who removed Earl Surrey, was sent thither, and in haste, too, lest he should help his father. That trick of state was a deep envious one. At his return, no doubt, he will requite it. This is noted, and generally, whoever the king favours, the cardinal instantly will find employment, and far from court, too. All the commons hate him perniciously, and, oh, my conscience, wish him ten fathom deep. This duke, as much they love and dote on, call him bounteous Buckingham, the mirror of all courtesy. Stay there, sir, and see the noble ruined man you speak of. Enter Buckingham from his arraignment, tipstaves before him the axe with the edge towards him 
halberds on each side, accompanied with Lavelle, Vow, Sands, and common people. Let's stand close and behold him. O oh, good people, you that thus far have come to pity me, hear what I say, and then go home and lose me. I have this day received a traitor's judgment, and by that name must die. Yet heaven bear witness, and if I have a conscience, let it sink me, even as the axe falls if I be not faithful. The law I bear no malice for my death. Tas done, upon the premises, but justice. But those that sought it I could wish more Christians. Be what they will, I heartily forgive them. Yet let them look, they glory not in mischief, nor build their evils on the graves of great men. For then my guiltless blood must cry against them. For further life in this world I ne'er hope. Nor will I sue, although the king have mercies more than I dare make faults. You few that love me, and dare be bold to weep for Buckingham. His noble friends and fellows, whom to leave is only bitter to him, only dying. Go with me, like good angels to my end. And, as the long divorce of steel falls on me, make of your prayers one sweet sacrifice, and lift my soul to heaven. Lead on, O God's name. I do beseech your grace for charity. If ever any malice in your heart were hid against me, now to forgive me frankly. Sir Thomas Lovell, as I free forgive you as I would be forgiven, I forgive all. There cannot be those numberless offences against me that I cannot take peace with. No black envy shall mark my grave. Commend me to his grace, and if he speak of Buckingham, pray, tell him you met him half in heaven. My vows and prayers yet are the king's, and, till my soul forsake, shall cry for blessings on him. May he live longer than I have time to tell his years. Ever beloved and loving may his rule be. And when old time shall lead him to his end, goodness and he fill up one monument. To the water-side I must conduct your grace, then give my charge up to Sir Nicholas Vaux, who undertakes you to your end. Prepare there. The duke is coming. See the barge be ready, and fit him with such furniture as suits the greatness of his person. Nay, Sir Nicholas, let it alone. My state now will but mock me. When I came hither, I was Lord High Constable and Duke of Buckingham, now poor Edward Bohun. Yet I am richer than my base accusers, that never knew what truth meant. I now seal it, and with the blood that make em one day groan for it. My noble father, Henry of Buckingham, who first raised head against usurping Richard, flying for succour to his servant Bannister, being distressed, was by that wretch betrayed, and without trial fell. God's peace be with him. Henry the Seventh succeeding, truly pitying my father's loss, like a most royal prince, restored me to my honours, and, out of ruins, made my name once more noble. Now his son, Henry the Eighth, life, honour, name, and all that made me happy at one stroke has taken for ever from the world. I had my trial, and, must needs say, a noble one, which makes me a little happier than my wretched father. Yet thus far we are one in fortunes, both fell by our servants, by those men we loved most. A most unnatural and faithless service. Heaven has an end in all, yet you that hear me, this from a dying man receive as certain, where you are liberal of your loves and counsels, be sure you be not loose, for those you would make friends and give your hearts to, when they once perceive the least rub in your fortunes, fall away like water from ye, never found again but where they mean to sink ye. All good people, pray for me. I must now forsake ye. The last hour of my long weary life is come upon me. Farewell, and when you would say something that is sad, speak how I fell. I have done, and God forgive me. Exunt Buckingham and Train Oh, this is full of pity. Sir, it calls, I fear, too many curses on their beads that were the authors. If the duke be guiltless, tis full of woe. Yet I can give you inkling of an ensuing evil, if it fall, greater than this. 
Good angels keep it from us. What may it be? You do not doubt my faith, sir. This secret is so weighty, it will require a strong faith to conceal it. Let me have it. I do not talk much. I am confident you shall, sir. Did you not of late days hear a buzzing of a separation between the king and Catherine? Yes, but it held not. For when the king once heard it, out of anger he sent command to the Lord Mayor straight to stop the rumor, and I'll lay those tongues that durst disperse it. But that slander, sir, is found a truth now, for it grows again fresher than e'er it was, and held for certain the king will venture at it. Either the cardinal, or some about him near, have, out of malice to the good queen, possessed him with a scruple that will undo her. To confirm this, too, Cardinal Campius has arrived, and lately, as all think for this business. Tis the Cardinal, and merely to revenge him on the Emperor for not bestowing on him, at his asking, the Archbishop of Toledo. This is purposed. I think you have hit the mark. But is not cruel that she should feel the smart of this? The Cardinal will have his will, and she must fall. Tis woeful. We are too open here to argue this. Let's think in private more. Exeunt. Scene two. An antechamber in the palace. Enter Chamberlain reading a letter. My lord, the horses your lordship sent for, with all the care I had, I saw well chosen, ridden, and furnished. They were young and handsome, and of the best breed in the north. When they were ready to set out for London, a man of my lord cardinals, by commission and main power, took them from me. With this reason, his master would be served before a subject, if not before the king, which stopped our mouths, sir. I fear he will indeed. Well, let them have him. He will have all, I think. Enter to Chamberlain, Norfolk and Suffolk. Well met, my lord Chamberlain. Good day to both your graces. How is the king employed? I left him private, full of sad thoughts and troubles. What's the cause? It seems the marriage with his brother's wife has crept too near his conscience. No, his conscience has crept too near another lady. Tis so. This is the cardinal's doing. The king cardinal, that blind priest, like the eldest son of fortune, turns what he list. The king will know him one day. Pray God he do. He'll never know himself else. How holily he works in all his business. And with what zeal! For now he has cracked the league between us and the Emperor, the Queen's great nephew. He dives into the King's soul, and there scatters dangers, doubts, ringing of the conscience, fears and despairs, and all these for his marriage. And out of all these to restore the King he counsels a divorce, a loss of her that, like a jewel, has hung twenty years about his neck, yet never lost her lustre. Of her that loves him with that excellence that angels love good men with, even of her, that when the greatest stroke of fortune falls, will bless the king, and is not this coarse pious? Heaven keep me from such counsel. Tis most true these news are everywhere. Every tongue speaks em, and every true heart weeps for it. All that dare look into these affairs see this main end, the French king's sister. Heaven will one day open the king's eyes that so long have slept upon this bold bad man. And free us from his slavery. We had need pray, and heartily, for our deliverance, or this imperious man will work us all from princes into page. All men's honours lie like one lump before him, to be fashioned into what pitch he please. For me, my lords, I love him not, nor fear him. There's my creed. As I am made without him, so I'll stand, if the king please. His curses and his blessings touch me alike. Their breath I not believe in. I knew him, and I know him, so I leave him to him that made him proud, the Pope. Let's in, and with some other business put the king from these sad thoughts that work too much upon him. My lord, you'll bear us company? Excuse me, the king has sent me otherwhere. Besides, you'll find a most unfit time to disturb him. Health to your lordships. Thanks, my good lord Chamberlain. Exit Chamberlain, and King Henry the Eighth draws the curtain, and sits reading pensively. How sad he looks! Sure he is much afflicted. Who's there, eh? Pray God he be not angry. Who's there, I say? 
How dare you thrust yourselves into my private meditations? Who am I? Ah! A gracious king that pardons all offences, malice ne'er meant. Our breach of duty this way is business of estate in which we come to know your royal pleasure. Ye are too bold. Go to. I'll make ye know your times of business. Is this an hour for temporal affairs, huh? Enter Cardinal Wolsey and Cardinal Campeus with a commission. Who's there? My good lord cardinal. Oh, my Wolsey, the quiet of my wounded conscience. Thou art a cure fit for a king. To Cardinal Campeus. You're welcome, most learned reverend sir, into our kingdom. Use it and us. To Cardinal Wolsey. My good lord, have great care I be not found a talker. Sir, you cannot. I would your grace would give us but an hour of private conference. To Norfolk and Suffolk. We are busy. Go. Aside to Suffolk. This priest has no pride in him. Aside to Norfolk. Not to speak of. I would not be so sick, though for his place. But this cannot continue. Aside to Suffolk. If it do, I'll venture one half at him. Aside to Norfolk. I another. Exeunt Norfolk and Suffolk. Your grace has given a precedent of wisdom above all princes in committing freely your scruple to the voice of Christendom. Who can be angry now? What envy reach you? The Spaniard, tied by blood and favour to her, must now confess, if they have any goodness, the trial just and noble. All the clerks, I mean the learned ones, in Christian kingdoms, have their free voices. Rome, the nurse of judgment, invited by your noble self, hath sent one general tongue unto us, this good man, this just and learned priest, Cardinal Campius, whom once more I present unto your highness. And once more in mine arms I bid him welcome, and thank the holy conclave for their loves. They have sent me such a man I would have wished for. Your grace must needs deserve all strangers' loves. You are so noble. To your highness' hand I tender my commission, by whose virtue the court of Rome commanding you, my lord cardinal of York, are joined with me, their servant, in the unpartial judging of this business. Two equal men. The queen shall be acquainted forthwith for what you come. Where's Gardner? I know your majesty has always loved her so dear in heart, not to deny her that a woman of less place might ask by law. Scholars allowed freely to argue for her. I and the best she shall have, and my favour to him that does best. God forbid else, cardinal. Prithee, call Gardner to me, my new secretary. I find him a fit fellow. Exit Cardinal Wolsey. Re-enter Cardinal Wolsey with Gardiner. Aside to Gardiner. Give me your hand, much joy and favour to you. You are the kings now. Aside to Cardinal Wolsey. But to be commanded for ever by your grace, whose hand has raised me. Come hither, Gardiner. Walks and whispers. My lord of York, was not one Dr. Pace in this man's place before him? Yes, he was. Was he not held a learned man? Yes, surely. Believe me, there's an ill opinion spread then, even of yourself, Lord Cardinal. How, of me? They will not stick to say you envied him, and fearing he would rise. He was so virtuous, kept him a foreign man still, which so grieved him that he ran mad and died. Heaven's peace be with him. That's Christian care enough. For living murmurers, there's places of rebuke. He was a fool, for he would needs be virtuous. That good fellow, if I command him, follows my appointment. I will have none so near else. Learn this, brother, we live not to be griped by meaner persons. Deliver this with modesty to the queen. Exit Gardiner. The most convenient place I can think of for such a receipt of learning is Blackfriars. There you shall meet about this weighty business. My Woolsey, see it furnished. Oh, my lord, would it not grieve an able man to live so sweet a bedfellow? 
but conscience conscience oh tis but a tender place and i must leave her exeunt scene three an antechamber of the queen's apartments enter anne and an old lady not for that neither here's the pang that pinches his highness having lived so long with her and she so good a lady that no tongue could ever pronounce dishonour of her by my life she never knew harm doing oh now after so many courses of the sun enthroned still growing in a majesty and pomp the which to leave a thousandfold more bitter than tis sweet at first to acquire after this process to give her the avaunt it is a pity would move a monster hearts of most hard temper melt and lament for her oh god's will much better she ne'er had known pomp though it be temporal yet if that quarrel fortune do divorce it from the bearer tis a sufferance panging as soul and body severing alas poor lady she is a stranger now again so much the more must pity drop upon her verily i swear tis better to be lowly born and range with humble livers in content than to be perked up in a glistering grief and wear a golden sorrow our content is our best having by my troth and maidenhead i would not be a queen beshrew me i would and venture maidenhead for it and so would you for all this spice of your hypocrisy you that have so fair parts of woman on you have to a woman's heart which ere yet affected eminence wealth sovereignty which to say sooth are blessings and which gifts saving your mincing the capacity of your soft chevrol's conscience would receive if you might please to stretch it nay good troth yes troth and troth you would not be a queen no not for all the riches under heaven tis strange a threepence boat would hire me old as i am to queen it but i pray you what think you of the duchess have you limbs to bear that load of title no in truth then you are weakly made pluck off a little i would not be a young count in your way for more than blushing comes to if your back cannot vouchsafe this burden tis too weak ever to get a boy how you do talk i swear again i would not be a queen for all the world in faith for little england you'll venture an embalming I myself would for Carnarvonshire, although there longed no more to the crown but that. Lo, who comes here? Enter Chamberlain. Good morrow, ladies. What were it worth to know the secret of your conference? My good lord, not your demand. It values not your asking. Our mistress sorrows we were pitying. It was a gentle business, and becoming the action of good women. There is hope. All will be well now i pray god amen you bear a gentle mind and heavenly blessings follow such creatures that you may fair lady perceive i speak sincerely and high notes ta'en of your many virtues the king's majesty commends his good opinion of you and does propose honour to you no less flowing than marchioness of pembroke to which title a thousand pound a year annual support out of his grace he adds i do not know what kind of my obedience i should tender more than my all is nothing nor my prayers are not words duly hallowed nor my wishes more worth than empty vanities yet prayers and wishes are all i can return beseech your lordship vouchsafe to speak my thanks and my obedience as from a blushing handmaid to his highness whose health and royalty i pray for lady i shall not fail to approve the fair conceit the king hath of you Aside i have perused her well beauty and honour in her are so mingled that they have caught the king and who knows yet but from this lady may proceed a gem to lighten all this isle i'll to the king and say i spoke with you exit chamberlain my honoured lord why this is it see see i have been begging sixteen years in court and yet a courtier beggarly nor could come pat betwixt too early and too late for any suit of pounds and you o oh fate a very fresh fish here fie 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 upon this compelled fortune have your mouth filled up before you open it this is strange to me how tastes it is it bitter forty pence no there was a lady once tis an old story that would not be a queen that would she not for all the mud in egypt 
Have you heard it? Come, you are pleasant. With your theme I could o'ermount the lark. The matroness of Pembroke, a thousand pounds a year for pure respect. No other obligation but my life that promises mo thousands. Honor's train is longer than his foreskirt. By this time I know your back will bear a duchess. Say, are you not stronger than you were? Good lady, make yourself mirth with your particular fancy, and leave me out on't. Would I had no being if this salute my blood a jot. It faints me to think what follows. The queen is comfortless, and we forgetful in our long absence. Pray do not deliver what here you've heard to her. What do you think me? Exeunt. Scene four. A hall in black friars. Trumpets, senate, and cornets. Enter two vergers with short silver wands. Next them, two scribes, in the habit of doctors. After them, Canterbury alone. After him, Lincoln, Eli, Rochester, and St. Asaph. Next them, with some small distance, follows a gentleman bearing the purse with the great seal, and a cardinal's hat. Then two priests, bearing each a silver cross. Then a gentleman usher, bareheaded, accompanied with a sergeant-at-arms, bearing a silver mace. Then two gentlemen, bearing two great silver pillars. After them, side by side, Cardinal Wolsey and Cardinal Compeius. Two noblemen with the sword and mace. King Henry the Eighth takes place under the cloth of state. Cardinal Wolsey and Cardinal Compeius sit under him as judges. Queen Catherine takes place some distance from King Henry the Eighth. The bishops place themselves on each side the court, in manner of a consistory. Below them, the scribes. The lords sit next the bishops. The rest of the attendants stand in convenient order about the stage. Whilst our commission from Rome is read, let silence be commanded. What's the need? It hath already publicly been read and on all sides the authority allowed. You may, then, spare that time. Be it so. Proceed. Say Henry, King of England, come into the court. Henry, King of England, come into the court. Here. Say Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Queen Catherine makes no answer, rises out of her chair, goes about the court, comes to King Henry the Eighth and kneels at his feet, then speaks. Sir, I desire you do me right and justice, and to bestow your pity on me, for I am a most poor woman, and a stranger, born out of your dominions, having here no judge indifferent, nor no more assurance of equal friendship and proceeding. Alas, sir! In what have I offended you? What cause hath my behaviour given to your displeasure, that thus you should proceed to put me off and take your good grace from me? Heaven witness I have been to you a true and humble wife, at all times to your will conformable, ever in fear to kindle your dislike, yea, a subject to your countenance, glad or sorry as I saw it inclined. When was the hour I ever contradicted your desire, or made it not mine too? Or which of your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were mine enemy? What friend of mine that had to him derived your anger did I continue in my liking? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Sir, call to mind that I have been your wife in this obedience upward of twenty years and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report, and prove it too against mine honour aught, my bond to wedlock, or my love and duty, against your sacred person, in God's name turn me away, and let the false contempt shut door upon me, and so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice. Please your sir, the king your father was reputed for a prince most prudent, of an excellent and unmatched wit and judgment. Ferdinand, my father, king of Spain, was reckoned one the wisest prince that there had reigned by many a year before. 
It is not to be questioned that they had gathered a wise counsel to them of every realm that did debate this business, who deemed our marriage lawful. Wherefore I humbly beseech you, sir, to spare me, till I may be by my friends in Spain advised, whose counsel I will implore. If not, in the name of God your pleasure be fulfilled. You have here, lady, and of your choice, these reverend fathers, men of singular integrity and learning, yea, the elect of the land, who are assembled to plead your cause. It shall be therefore bootless that longer you desire the court, as well for your own quiet as to rectify what is unsettled in the king. His great has spoken well and justly. Therefore, madam, it's fit this royal session do proceed and that without delay their arguments be now produced and heard lord cardinal to you i speak your pleasure madam sir i am about to weep but thinking that we are a queen or long have dreamed so certain the daughter of a king my drops of tears i'll turn to sparks of fire be patient yet I will when you are humble, nay before, or God will punish me. I do believe, induced by potent circumstances, that you are mine enemy, and make my challenge, you shall not be my judge. For it is you have blown this call betwixt my lord and me, which gods do quench. Therefore I say again, I utterly abhor, yea, from my soul, refuse you for my judge whom yet once more I hold my most malicious foe, and think not at all a friend to truth. I do profess you speak not like yourself, who ever yet have stood to charity, and displayed the effects of disposition gentle, and of wisdom overtopping woman's power. Madam, you do me wrong. I have no spleen against you, nor injustice for you, or any. How far I have proceeded, or how far further shall, is warranted by a commission from the consistory, yea, the whole consistory of Rome. You charge me that I have blown this coal. I do deny it. The king is present. If it be known to him that I gainsay my deed, how may he wound and worthily my falsehood? Yea, as much as you have done my truth. If he knows that I am free of your report, he knows I am not of your wrong. Therefore in him it lies to cure me, and the cure is to remove these thoughts from you, the which before his highness shall speak in, I do beseech you, gracious madam, to unthink your speaking, and to say so no more. My lord, my lord, I am a simple woman, much too weak to oppose your cunning. Your meek and humble mouthed, you sign your place, and calling in full seeming with meekness and humility. But your heart is crammed with arrogance, spleen, and pride. You have by fortune and his highness' favours gone slightly or low steps, and now are mounted where powers are your retainers, and your words, domestics too, you serve your will as to please yourself pronounce their office. I must tell you, you tender more your person's honour than your high profession spiritual, that again I do refuse you for my judge, and here before you all appeal unto the Pope, to bring my whole cause for his holiness, and to be judged by him. She curtsies to King Henry the Eighth and offers to depart. The Queen is obstinate, stubborn to justice apt to accuse it, and disdainful to be tried by it. Tis not well. She's going away. Call her again. Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Madam, you are called back. What need you note it? Pray you keep your way. When you are called, return. Now the Lord help they vex me past my patience. Pray you pass on. I will not tarry. No, nor ever more upon this business my appearance make in any of their courts. Exeunt Queen Catherine and her attendants. Go thy ways, Kate. 
that man in the world who shall report he has a better wife let him in naught be trusted for speaking false in that thou art alone if thy rare qualities sweet gentleness thy meekness saint-like wife-like government a being in commanding and thy part sovereign and pious else could speak thee out the queen of earthly queens she's noble-born and like her true nobility she has carried herself towards me most gracious sir in humblest manner i require your highness that it shall please you to declare in hearing of all these ears for where i am robbed and bound there must i be unloosed although not there at once and fully satisfied whether ever i did broach this business to your highness or laid any scruple in your way which might induce you to the question on it or ever have to you but with thanks to god for such a royal lady spake one the least word that might be to the prejudice of her present state or touch of her good person my lord cardinal i do excuse you yea upon mine honour i free you from it you are not to be taught that you have many enemies that know not why they are so but like the village curs bark when their fellows do by some of these the queen is put in anger you're excused but will you be more justified you ever have wished the sleeping of this business never desired it to be stirred but oft have hindered oft the passage is made toward it on my honour i speak my good lord cardinal to this point and thus far clear him now what moved me to it i will be bold with time and your attention then mark the inducement thus it came give heed to it my conscience first received the tenderness scruple and prick on certain speeches uttered by the bishop of bayonne then french ambassador who had been hither sent on the debating a marriage twixt the duke of orleans and our daughter mary in the progress of this business ere a determinate resolution he i mean the bishop did require a respite wherein he might the king his lord advertise whether our daughter were legitimate respecting this our marriage with the dowager sometimes our brother's wife this respite shook the bosom of my conscience entered me yea with a splitting power and made to tremble the region of my breast which forced such way that many maze considerings did throng and pressed in with this caution first methought i stood not in the smile of heaven who had commanded nature that my lady's womb if it conceived a male child by me should do no more office of life to it than the grave does to the dead for her male issue or died where they had been made or shortly after this world had aired them hence i took a thought this was a judgment on me that my kingdom well worthy the best heir of the world should not be gladded in by me then follows that i weighed the danger in which my realm stood in by this my issues fail and that gave to me many a groaning throw thus hulling in the wild sea of my conscience I did steer toward this remedy, whereupon we are now present here together. That's to say, I meant to rectify my conscience, which I then did feel full sick, and yet not well, by all the reverend fathers of the land and doctors learned. First I began in private with you, my lord of Lincoln. You remember how under my oppression I did reek when I first moved you. Very well, my liege. I have spoke long. Be pleased yourself to say how far you satisfied me. So please your highness, the question did at first so stagger me, bearing a state of mighty moment in it, and consequence of dread, that I committed to the daringst counsel which I had to doubt, and did entreat your highness to this course which you are running here. I then moved you, my lord of Canterbury, and got your leave to make this present summons. Unsolicited I left no reverend person in this court, but by particular consent proceeded under your hands and seals. Therefore go on, for no dislike of the world against the person of the good queen, but the sharp thorny points of my alleged reasons drive this forward. Prove but our marriage lawful, by my life and kingly dignity, we are contented to wear our mortal state to come with her, Catherine our queen, before the primest creature that's paragoned of the world. So please your highness, 
the queen being absent tis a needful fitness that we adjourn this court till further day meanwhile must be an earnest motion made to the queen to call back her appeal she intends unto his holiness aside though i may perceive these cardinals trifle with me i abhor this dilatory sloth and tricks of rome my learned and well-beloved servant cranmer prithee return with thy approach i know my comfort comes along break up the court i say set on exeunt in manner as they entered end of act two Act Three of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Henry the Eighth, Act Three. Scene One, London, Queen Catherine's Apartments. Enter Queen Catherine and her women as at work. Take thy lute, wench. My soul grows sad with troubles. Sing and disperse them if thou canst. Leave working. Fierce with his lute may trees and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing. To his music, plants and flowers ever sprung as sun and shower. That made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such a killing care and grief. Enter a gentleman. How now? And please your grace, the two Greek cardinals wait in the presence. Would they speak with me? They will me say so, madam. Pray their graces to come near. Exit gentleman. What can be their business with me? A poor weak woman fallen from favour. I do not like their coming. Now I think on it they should be good men, their affairs as righteous. But all hoods make not monks. Enter Cardinal Wolsey and Cardinal Compeius. Peace to your highness. Your graces find me here part of a housewife. I would be all against the worst may happen. What are your pleasures with me, reverend lords? May it please you, noble madam, to withdraw into your private chamber. We shall give you the full cause of our coming. Speak it here. There's nothing I have done yet that my conscience deserves a corner. Would all other women could speak this with as free a soul as I do. My lords, I care not so much I am happy above a number, if my actions were tried by every tongue, every eye saw em, envy and base opinion set against em, I know my life so even. If your business seek me out, and that way I am wife in, out with it boldly. Truth loves open dealing. Tenta est erga te mentis integritas, regina serenissima. Oh, good my lord, no Latin. I am not such a truant since my coming as not to know the language I have lived in. A strange tongue makes my cause more strange, suspicious. Pray speak in English. Here are some will thank you if you speak truth for their poor mistress' sake. Believe me, she has had much wrong. Lord Cardinal, the willingest sin I ever yet committed may be absolved in English. Noble lady, I am sorry my integrity should breed, and service to his majesty and you, so deep suspicion where all faith was meant. We come not by the way of accusation to taint that honour every good tongue blesses, nor to betray you any way to sorrow. You have too much, good lady but to know how you stand minded in the weighty difference between the king and you, 
and to deliver like free and honest men our just opinions and comforts to your cause most honoured madam my lord of york out of his noble nature seal and obedience he still bore your grace forgetting like a good man your late censor both of his truth and him which was too far offers as i do in a sign of peace his service and his counsel aside to betray me my lords i thank you both for your good wills ye speak like honest men pray god ye prove so but how to make ye suddenly an answer in such a point of weight so near mine honour more near my life i fear with my weak wit and true such men of gravity and learning in truth i know not i was set at work among my maids full little god knows looking either for such men or such business for her sake that i have been for i fear the last fit of my greatness good your graces let me have time and counsel for my cause alas i am a woman friendless hopeless madam you wrong the king's love with these fears your hopes and friends are infinite in england but little for my profit can you think lords that any englishman dare give me counsel or be a known friend gainst his highness pleasure though he be grown so desperate to be honest and live a subject nay forsooth my friends they that must weigh out my afflictions they that my trust must grow to live not here they are as all my other comforts far hence in mine own country lords i would your grace would leave your griefs and take my counsel how sir put your main cause into the king's protection he is loving and most gracious it will be much both for your honour better and your cause for if the trial of the law overtake ye you will part away disgraced he tells you rightly ye tell me what ye wish for both my ruin is this your christian counsel out upon ye heaven is above all yet there sits a judge that no king can corrupt your rage mistakes us the more shame for ye holy men i thought ye upon my soul too reverend cardinal virtues but cardinal sins and hollow hearts i fear ye mend em for shame my lords is this your comfort the cordial that ye bring a wretched lady a woman lost among ye laughed at scorned i will not wish ye half my miseries i have more charity but say i warned ye take heed for heaven's sake take heed lest at once the burden of my sorrows fall upon ye madam this is a mere distraction you turn the good we offer into envy ye turn me into nothing woe upon ye and all such false professors would you have me if you have any justice any pity if ye be anything but churchmen's habits put my sick cause into his hands that hates me alas has banished me his bed already his love too long ago i am old my lords and all the fellowship i hold now with him is only my obedience what can happen to me above this wretchedness all your studies make me a curse like this your fears are worse have i lived thus long let me speak myself since virtue finds no friends a wife a true one a woman i dare say without vain glory never yet branded with suspicion have i with all my full affection still met the king loved him next heaven obeyed him been out of fondness superstitious to him almost forgot my prayers to content him and am i thus rewarded tis not well lords bring me a constant woman to her husband one that ne'er dreamed a joy beyond his pleasure and to that woman when she has done most yet will i add an honour a great patience madam you wander from the good we aim at my lord i dare not make myself so guilty to give up willingly that noble title your master wed me to 
Nothing but death shall e'er divorce my dignities. Pray hear me. Would I had never trod this English earth, or felt the flatteries that grow upon it. Ye have angels' faces, but heaven knows your hearts. What will become of me now, wretched lady? I am the most unhappy woman living. Alas, poor wenches! Where are now your fortunes? Shipwrecked upon a kingdom where no pity, no friend, no hope, no kindred weep for me. Almost no grave allowed me. Like the lily that once was mistress of the field and flourished, I'll hang my head and perish. If your grace could but be brought to know our ends are honest, you'd feel more comfort. Why should we, good lady, upon what cause wrong you? Alas, our places, the way of our profession, is against it. We are to cure such sorrows, not to sow em. For goodness sake, consider what you do, how you may hurt yourself. I utterly grow from the king's acquaintance by this carriage. The hearts of princes kiss obedience, so much they love it. But to stubborn spirits they swell and grow as terrible as storms. I know you have a gentle, noble temper, a soul as even as a calm. Pray, think us those we profess, peacemakers, friends, and servants. Madam, you'll find it so. You wrong your virtues with these weak women's fears. A noble spirit as yours was put into you, ever cast such doubts as false coin from it. The king loves you. Beware you lose it not. For us, if you please to trust us in your business, we are ready to use our utmost studies in your service. Do what ye will, my lords, and pray forgive me if I have used myself unmannerly. You know I am a woman, lacking wit to make a seemly answer to such persons. Pray do my service to his majesty. He has my heart yet and shall have my prayers while I shall have my life. Come, reverend fathers, bestow your counsels on me. She now begs that little thought when she set footing here she should have bought her dignities so dear. Exeunt. Scene two. Antechamber to King Henry the Eighth's apartment. Enter Norfolk, Suffolk, Surrey, and Chamberlain. If you will now unite in your complaints and force them with a constancy, the cardinal cannot stand under them. If you omit the offer of this time, I cannot promise but that you shall sustain more new disgraces, with these you bear already. I am joyful to meet the least occasion that may give me remembrance of my father-in-law, the duke, to be revenged on him. Which of the peers have uncondemned gone by him, or at least strangely neglected? When did he regard the stamp of nobleness in any person out of himself? My lords, you speak your pleasures. What he deserves of you and me, I know. What we can do to him, though now the time gives way to us, I much fear. If you cannot bar his access to the king, never attempt anything on him, for he hath a witchcraft over the king in his tongue. Oh, fear him not. His spell in that is out. The king hath found matter against him, that for ever mars the honey of his language. No, he's settled, not to come off in his displeasure. Sir, I should be glad to hear such news as this once every hour. Believe it, this is true. In the divorce his contrary proceedings are all unfolded wherein he appears, as I would wish mine enemy. How came his practices to light? Most strangely. Oh, how, how! The cardinal's letters to the Pope miscarried, and came to the eye of the king, wherein was read how that the cardinal did entreat his holiness to stay the judgment of the divorce, for if it did take place, I do, quoth he, perceive my king is tangled in affection to a creature of the queen's, Lady Anne Boleyn. Has the king this? Believe it. Will this work? The king in this perceives him, how he coasts and hedges his own way. But in this point all his tricks founder, and he brings his physic after his patient's death. 
the king already hath married the fair lady would he had may you be happy in your wish my lord for i profess you have it now all my joy trace the conjunction my amen to it all men's there's order given for her coronation marry this is yet but young and may be left to some ears unrecounted but my lords she is a gallant creature and complete in mind and feature i persuade me from her will fall some blessing to this land which shall in it be memorized but will the king digest this letter of the cardinals the lord forbid marry amen no no there be more wasps that buzz about his nose will make this sting the sooner cardinal campeus has stolen away to rome hath taken no leave has left the cause of the king unhandled and is posted as the agent of our cardinal to second all his plot i do assure you the king cried ha at this now god incense him and let him cry ha louder but my lord when returns cramner he is returned in his opinions which have satisfied the king for his divorce together with all famous colleges almost in christendom shortly i believe his second marriage shall be published and her coronation catherine no more shall be called queen but princess dowager and widow to prince arthur this same cranmer is a worthy fellow and hath ta'en much pain in the king's business he has and we shall see him for it an archbishop so i hear tis so the cardinal enter cardinal wolsey and cromwell observe observe he's moody the packet cromwell gave it you the king to his own hand in his bedchamber look he of the inside of the paper presently he did unseal them and the first he viewed he did it with a serious mind a heed was in his countenance you he bade attend him here this morning is he ready to come abroad i think by this he is leave me a while exit cromwell aside it shall be to the duchess of alencon the french king's sister he shall marry her and bullen no i'll know and bullens for him there's more in it than fair visage bullen now we'll know bullens speedily i wish to hear from rome the marchioness of pembroke he is discontented maybe he hears the king does wet his anger to him sharp enough lord for thy justice aside the late queen's gentlewoman a knight's daughter to be her mistress mistress the queen's queen this candle burns not clear tis i must snuff it then out it goes what though i know her virtuous and well-deserving yet i know her for a spleeny lutheran and not wholesome to our cause that she should lie in the bosom of our hard-ruled king again there is sprung up an heretic an arch one cranmer one hath crawled into the favour of the king and is his oracle he is vexed at something i would twere something that would fret the string the master cordon's heart Enter King Henry the Eighth, reading of a schedule and Lavelle. The king, the king! What piles of wealth hath he accumulated to his own portion? And what expense by the hour seems to flow from him? How, in the name of thrift, does he rake this together? Now, my lords, saw you the cardinal? My lord, we have stood here observing him some strange commotion is in his brain he bites his lip and starts stops on a sudden looks upon the ground then lays his finger on his temple straight springs out into a fast gait then stops again strikes his breast hard and anon he casts his eye against the moon in most strange postures we have seen him set himself it may well be there is a mutiny in his mind this morning papers of state he sent me to peruse as i required and watch you what i found there on my conscience put unwittingly forsooth an inventory thus importing the several parcels of his plate his treasure rich stuffs and ornaments of household which i find at such proud rate that it outspeaks possession of a subject it's heaven's will 
some spirit put this paper in the packet to bless your eye with all if we did think his contemplation were above the earth and fixed on spiritual object he should still dwell in his musings but i am afraid his thinkings are below the moon not worth his serious considering king henry the eighth takes his seat whispers lavelle who goes to cardinal wolsey heaven forgive me ever god bless your highness good my lord you are full of heavenly stuff and bear the inventory of your best graces in your mind the which you are now running o'er you have scarce time to steal from spiritual leisure a brief span to keep your earthly audit sure in that i deem you an ill husband and am glad to have you there in my companion sir for holy offices i have a time a time to think upon the part of business which i bear in the state and nature does require her times of preservation which perforce i her frail son amongst my brethren mortal must give my tendance to you have said well and ever may your highness yoke together as i will lend you cause my doing well with my well saying tis well said again and tis a kind of good deed to say well yet words are no deed my father loved you he said he did and with his deed did crown his word upon you since i had my office i have kept you next my heart have not alone employed you where high profits might come home but paired my present havings to bestow my bounties upon you aside what should this mean aside the lord increase this business have i not made you the prime man of the state i pray you tell me if what i now pronounce you have found true and if you may confess it say withal if you are bound to us or no what say you my sovereign i confess your royal graces showered on me daily have been more than could my studied purposes requite which went beyond all man's endeavours my endeavours have ever come too short of my desires yet filed with my abilities mine own ends have been mine so that evermore they pointed to the good of your most sacred person and the profit of the state for your great graces heaped upon me poor undeserver i can nothing render but allegiant thanks my prayers to heaven for you my loyalty which ever has and ever shall be growing till death that winter kill it fairly answered a loyal and obedient subject is therein illustrated the honour of it does pay the act of it as in the contrary the foulness is the punishment i presume that as my hand has opened bounty to you my heart dropped love my power rained honour more on you than any so your hand and heart your brain and every function of your power should notwithstanding that your bond of duty as twere in love's particular be more to me your friend than any i do profess that for your highness good i ever laboured more than mine own that am have and will be though all the world should crack their duty to you and throw it from their soul though perils did abound as thick as thought could make em and appear in forms more horrid yet my duty as doth a rock against the chiding flood should the approach of this wild river break and stand unshaken yours tis nobly spoken take notice lords he has a loyal breast for you have seen him open it read o'er this giving him papers and after this and then to breakfast with what appetite you have exit king henry the eighth frowning upon cardinal wolsey the nobles throng after him smiling and whispering what should this mean what sudden anger is this how have i reaped it he parted frowning from me as if ruin leaped from his eyes so looks the chafed lion upon the daring huntsman that has galled him then makes him nothing i must read this paper i fear the story of his anger tis so this paper has undone me tis the account of all that world of wealth i have drawn together for mine own ends 
indeed to gain the popedom and fee my friends in rome o oh, negligence fit for a fool to fall by what cross devil made me put this main secret in the packet i sent the king is there no way to cure this no new device to beat this from his brains i know twill stir him strongly yet i know a way if i take right in spite of fortune will bring me off again what's this to the pope the letter as i live with all the business i writ to his holiness nay then farewell i have touched the highest point of all my greatness and from that full meridian of my glory i haste now to my setting i shall fall like a bright exhalation in the evening and no man see me more re-enter to cardinal wolsey norfolk and suffolk surrey and the chamberlain here the king's pleasure cardinal who commands you to render up the great seal presently into our hands and to confine yourself to asher house my lord of winchester's till you hear further from his highness stay where's your commission lords words cannot carry authority so weighty who dare cross em bearing the king's will from his mouth expressly till i find more than will or words to do it i mean your malice no officious lords i dare and must deny it now i feel of what coarse metal ye are moulded envy how eagerly ye follow my disgraces as if it fed ye and how sleek and wanton ye appear in everything may bring my ruin follow your envious courses men of malice you have christian warrant for em and no doubt in time will find their fit rewards that seal you ask with such a violence the king mine and your master with his own hand gave me bade me enjoy it with the place and honours during my life and to confirm his goodness tied it by letters patents now who will take it the king that gave it it must be himself then thou art a proud traitor priest proud lord thou liest within these forty hours surrey durst better have burnt that tongue than said so thy ambition thou scarlet sin robbed this bewailing land of noble buckingham my father-in-law the heads of all thy brother cardinals with thee and all thy best parts bound together weighed not a hair of his plague of your policy you sent me deputy for ireland far from his succour from the king from all that might have mercy on the fault thou gavest him whilst your great goodness out of holy pity absolved him with an axe this and all else this talking lord can lay upon my credit i answer is most false the duke by law found his deserts how innocent i was from any private malice in his end his noble jury and foul cause can witness if i loved many words lord i should tell you you have as little honesty as honour that in the way of loyalty and truth toward the king my ever royal master dare mate a sounder man than surrey can be and all that love his follies by my soul your long coat priest protects you thou shouldst feel my sword i the life-blood of thee else my lords can ye endure to hear this arrogance and from this fellow if we live thus tamely to be thus jaded by a piece of scarlet farewell nobility let his grace go forward and dare us with his cap like larks all goodness is poison to thy stomach yes that goodness of gleaning all the land's wealth into one into your own hands cardinal by extortion the goodness of your intercepted packets you writ to the pope against the king your goodness since you provoke me shall be most notorious my lord of norfolk as you are truly noble as you respect the common good the state of our despised nobility our issues who if he live will scarce be gentlemen produce the grand sum of his sins the articles collected from his life i'll startle you worse than the scaring bell when the brown wench lay kissing in your arms lord cardinal how much methinks i could despise this man but that i am bound in charity against it those articles my lord are in the king's hand 
but thus much they are foul ones so much fairer and spotless shall mine innocence arise when the king knows my truth this cannot save you i thank my memory i yet remember some of these articles and out they shall now if you can blush and cry guilty cardinal you'll show a little honesty speak on sir i dare your worst objections if i blush it is to see a nobleman want manners i had rather want those than my head have at you first that without the king's assent or knowledge you wrought to be a legate by which power you maimed the jurisdiction of all bishops then that in all you rich to rome or else to foreign princes ergo et rex meus was still inscribed in which you brought the king to be your servant then that without the knowledge either of king or council when you went ambassador to the emperor you made bold to carry into flanders the great seal item you sent a large commission to gregory de casado to conclude without the king's will or the state's allowance a league between his highness and ferrara that out of mere ambition you have caused your holy hat to be stamped on the king's coin then that you have sent innumerable substance by what means got i leave to your own conscience to furnish rome and to prepare the ways you have for dignities to the mere undoing of all the kingdom many more there are which since they are of you and odious i will not taint my mouth with o oh, my lord press not a falling man too far tis virtue his faults lie open to the laws let them not you correct him my heart weeps to see him so little of his great self i forgive him lord cardinal the king's further pleasure is because all those things you have done of late by your power legatine within this kingdom fall into the compass of a premunir that therefore such a writ be sued against you to forfeit all your goods lands tenements chattels and whatsoever and to be out of the king's protection this is my charge and so we'll leave you to your meditations how to live better for your stubborn answer about the giving back the great seal to us the king shall know it and no doubt shall thank you so fare you well my little good lord cardinal exeunt all but cardinal wolsey so farewell to the little good you bear me farewell a long farewell to all my greatness this is the state of man to-day he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes to-morrow blossoms and bears his blushing honours thick upon him the third day comes a frost a killing frost and when he thinks good easy man full surely his greatness is a ripening nips his root and then he falls as i do i have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory but far beyond my depth my high-blown pride at length broke under me and now has left me weary and old with service to the mercy of a rude stream that must for ever hide me vain pomp and glory of this world i hate ye i feel my heart new opened oh how wretched is that poor man that hangs on princes favours there is betwixt that smile we would aspire to that sweet aspect of princes and their ruin more pangs and fears than wars or women have and when he falls he falls like lucifer never to hope again enter cromwell and stands amazed why how now cromwell i have no power to speak sir what amazed at my misfortunes can thy spirit wonder a great man should decline nay and you weep i am fallen indeed how does your grace why well never so truly happy my good cromwell i know myself now and i feel within me a peace above all earthly dignities a still and quiet conscience the king has cured me i humbly thank his grace 
and from these shoulders these ruined pillars out of pity taken a load would sink a navy too much honour oh tis a burthen cromwell tis a burthen too heavy for a man that hopes for heaven i am glad your grace has made that right use of it i hope i have i am able now methinks out of a fortitude of soul i feel to endure more miseries and greater far than my weak-hearted enemies dare offer what news abroad the heaviest and the worst is your displeasure with the king god bless him the next is that sir thomas more is chosen lord chancellor in your place that's somewhat sudden but he's a learned man may he continue long in his highness favour and do justice for truth's sake and his conscience that his bones when he has run his course and sleeps in blessings may have a tomb of orphans tears wept on him what more that cranmer is returned with welcome installed lord archbishop of canterbury that's news indeed last that the lady anne whom the king hath in secrecy long married this day was viewed in open as his queen going to chapel and the voice is now only about her coronation there was the weight that pulled me down o oh, cromwell the king has gone beyond me all my glories in that one woman i have lost for ever no son shall ever usher forth mine honours or gild again the noble troops that waited upon my smiles go get thee from me cromwell i am a poor fallen man unworthy now to be thy lord and master seek the king that sun i pray may never set i have told him what and how true thou art he will advance thee some little memory of me will stir him i know his noble nature not to let thy hopeful service perish too good cromwell neglect him not make use now and provide for thine own future safety o lord must then i leave you must i needs forego so good so noble and so true a master bear witness all that have not hearts of iron with what a sorrow cromwell leaves his lord the king shall have my service but my prayers for ever and for ever shall be yours cromwell i did not think to shed a tear in all my miseries but thou hast forced me out of thy honest truth to play the woman let's dry our eyes and thus far hear me cromwell and when i am forgotten as i shall be and sleep in dull cold marble where no mention of me more must be heard of say i taught thee say wolsey that once trod the ways of glory and sounded all the depths and shoals of honour found thee a way out of his wreck to rise in a sure and safe one though thy master missed it mark but my fall and that that ruined me cromwell i charge thee fling away ambition by that sin fell the angels how can man then the image of his maker hope to win by it love thyself last cherish those hearts that hate thee corruption wins not more than honesty still in thy right hand carry gentle peace to silence envious tongues be just and fear not let all the ends thou aimest at be thy country's thy god's and truth's then if thou fallest o cromwell thou fallest a blessed martyr serve the king and prithee lead me in there take an inventory of all i have to the last penny tis the king's my robe and my integrity to heaven is all i dare now call mine own o oh, cromwell cromwell had i but served my god with half the zeal i served my king he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies good sir have patience so i have farewell the hopes of court my hopes in heaven do dwell exeunt end of act three
Act Four of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Henry the Eighth, Act Four. Scene One: A Street in Westminster. Enter two gentlemen meeting one another. You're well met once again. So are you. You come to take your stand here, and behold, the Lady Anne pass from her coronation. Tis all my business. At our last encounter, the Duke of Buckingham came from his trial. Tis very true, but that time offered sorrow. This general joy. Tis well. The citizens, I am sure, have shown at full their royal minds. As let them have their rights, they are ever forward, in celebration of this day with shows, pageants, and sights of honor. Never greater, nor, I'll assure you, better taken, sir. May I be bold to ask at what that contains, that paper in your hand? Yes, tis the list of those that claim their offices this day by custom of the coronation. The Duke of Suffolk is the first, and claims to be high steward, next the Duke of Norfolk, he to be Earl Marshal. You may read the rest. I thank you, sir. Had I not known those customs, I should have been beholding to your paper. But I beseech you, what's become of Catherine, the Princess Dowager? How goes her business? That I can tell you, too. The Archbishop of Canterbury, accompanied with other learned and reverend fathers of his order, held a late court at Dunstable, six miles off from Anthel, where the Princess lay, to which she was often cited by them, but appeared not. And to be short, for not appearance in the king's late scruple, by the main ascent of all these learned men she was divorced and the late marriage made of none effect, since which she was removed to Kimbleton, where she remains now sick. Alas, good lady! Trumpets. The trumpet sounds. Stand close. The queen is coming. Hot boys. The order of the coronation. One, a lively flourish of trumpets. Two, then two judges. Three, Lord Chancellor, with the purse and mace before him. Four choristers singing. Music. Five mayor of London bearing the mace. Then garter in his coat of arms and on his head a gilt copper crown. Six marquess d'orset bearing a sceptre of gold, on his head a demi coronal of gold. With him Surrey bearing the rod of silver with the dove crowned with an earl's coronet. Collars of S.S. Seven. Suffolk, in his robe of estate, his coronet on his head, bearing a long white wand as high steward. With him, Norfolk, with the rod of marshalship, a coronet on his head. Collars of S.S. 8. A canopy borne by four of the syncoports, under it, Queen Anne in her robe. In her hair, richly adorned with pearl, crowned. On each side her, the bishops of London and Winchester. 9 the old Duchess of Norfolk in a coronal of gold, wrought with flowers, bearing Queen Anne's train. 10. Certain ladies or countesses with plain circlets of gold without flowers. They pass over the stage in order and state. A royal train, believe me. These I know. Who's that that bears the scepter? Marquis Dorset, and that the Earl of Surrey with the rod. A bold, brave gentleman. That should be the Duke of Suffolk? Tis the same, high steward. And that my lord of Norfolk? Yes. Heaven bless thee. Looking on Queen Anne. Thou hast the sweetest face I ever looked on. Sir, as I have a soul, she is an angel. Our king has all the Indies in his arms, and more the richer when he strains that lady. I cannot blame his conscience. They that bear the cloth of honor over her are four barons of the sink ports. Those men are happy, and so are all, are near her. I take it she that carries up the train is that old noble lady, Duchess of Norfolk? It is, and all the rest are countesses. Their coronets say so. These are stars indeed, and sometimes falling ones. No more of that. Exit procession, and then a great flourish of trumpets. Enter a third gentleman. God save you, sir. Where have you been broiling? Among the crowd in the abbey. Where a finger could not be wedged in more, I am stifled with the mere rankness of their joy. 
You saw the ceremony? That I did. How was it? Well worth the seeing. Good sir, speak it to us. As well as I am able, the rich stream of lords and ladies, having brought the queen to a prepared place in the choir, fell off a distance from her, while her grace sat down to rest a while, some half an hour or so, in a rich chair of state, opposing freely the beauty of her person to the people. Believe me, sir, she is the goodliest woman that ever lay by man, which, when the people had the full view of, such a noise arose as the shrouds make at sea in a stiff tempest, as loud and to as many tunes. Hats, cloaks, doublets, I think, flew up, and had their faces been loose, this day they had been lost. Such joy I never saw before, great-bellied women that had not half a week to go, like rams in the old time of war, would shake the press, and make him reel before him. No man living could say, This is my wife, there. All were woven so strangely in one piece. But what followed? At length her grace rose, and with modest paces came to the altar, where she kneeled, and saint-like cast her fair eyes to heaven, and prayed devoutly. Then rose again, and bowed her to the people. When, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, she had all the royal makings of a queen, as holy oil, Edward Confessor's crown, the rod and bird of peace, and all such emblems laid nobly on her. Which performed, the choir, with all the choicest music of the kingdom, together sung Te Deum. So she parted, and with the same full state, paced back again to York Place, where the feast is held. Sir, you must no more call it York Place, that's past, for since the cardinal fell, that title's lost. "'Tis now the king's and called Whitehall. "'I know it, but tis so lately altered "'that the old name is fresh about me. "'What two reverend bishops were those "'that went on each side of the queen? "'Stokesley and Gardiner, "'the one of Winchester, newly preferred "'from the king's secretary, "'the other, London. "'He of Winchester has held no great good lover "'of the archbishops, the virtuous Cranmer. "'All the land knows that. "'However, yet there is no great breach, when it comes, Cranmer will find a friend will not shrink from him. Who may that be, I pray you? Thomas Cromwell, a man in much esteem with the king, and truly a worthy friend. The king has made him master of the jewel house, and one already of the privy council. He will deserve more. Yes, without all doubt. Come, gentlemen, ye shall go my way, which is to the court, and there ye shall be my guests, something I can command. As I walk thither, I'll tell ye more. You, you may, may command, command us, sir. sir. Exeunt. Scene two. Kim Bolton. Enter Catherine, dowager, sick, led between Griffith, her gentleman usher, and Patience, her woman. How does your grace? O oh, Griffith, sick to death, my legs like loaden branches bow to the earth, willing to leave their burden. Reach a chair. Oh, so now methinks I feel a little ease. Didst thou not tell me, Griffith, as thou ledst me, that the great child of honour, Cardinal Wolsey, was dead? Yes, madam, but I think your grace, out of the pain you suffered, gave no ear to it. Prithee, good Griffith, tell me how he died. If well he stepped before me, happily for my example. Well, the voice goes, madam. For after the stout Earl Northumberland arrested him at York, he brought him forward, as a man sorely tainted, to his answer. He fell sick suddenly, and grew so ill he could not sit his mule. Alas, poor man! At last, with easy roads, he came to Leicester, lodged in the abbey, where the reverend abbot, with all his covent, honorably received him, to whom he gave these words, Oh, Father Abbot, an old man! broken with the storms of state, is come to lay his weary bones among ye. Give him a little earth for charity. So went to bed, where eagerly his sickness pursued him still, and, three nights after this, about the hour of eight, which he himself foretold should be his last, full of repentance, continual meditations, tears, and sorrows, he gave his honors to the world again, his blessed part to heaven, and slept in peace. So may he rest, his faults lie gently on him. 
Yet thus far Griffith give me leave to speak him, and yet with charity. He was a man of an unbounded stomach, ever ranking himself with princes, one that by suggestion tied all the kingdom. Simony was fair play, his own opinion was his law. In the presence he would say untruths, and be ever double both in his words and meaning. He was never but where he meant to ruin pitiful. His promises were, as he was then, mighty, but his performance, as he is now, nothing. Of his own body he was ill, and gave the clergy an example. Noble madam, men's evil manners live in brass. Their virtues we write in water. May it please your highness to hear me speak his good now? Yes, good Griffith, I wear malicious else. This cardinal, though from an humble stock, undoubtedly was fashioned to much honour from his cradle. He was a scholar, and a ripe and good one, exceeding wise, fair-spoken, and persuading, lofty and sour to them that loved him not, but to those men that sought him sweet as summer. And though he was unsatisfied in getting, which was a sin, yet in bestowing, madam, he was most princely, ever witness for him those twins of learning that he raised in you, Ipswich and Oxford, one of which fell with him, unwilling to outlive the good that it did. The other, though unfinished, yet so famous, so excellent in art, and still so rising, that Christendom shall ever speak his virtue. His overthrow heaped happiness upon him, for then, and not till then, he felt himself, and found the blessedness of being little, and, to add greater honours to his age than man could give him, he died fearing God. After my death I wish no other herald, no other speaker of my living actions, to keep mine honour from corruption, but such an honest chronicler as Griffith, whom I most hated living, thou hast made me with thy religious truth and modesty, now in his ashes honour. Peace be with him. Patience, be near me still, and set me lower. I have not long to trouble thee. Good Griffith, cause the musicians play me that sad note I named my knell, whilst I sit meditating on that celestial harmony I go to. Sad and solemn music. She is asleep. Good wench, let's sit down quiet, for fear we wake her. Softly, gentle patience. The vision. Enter, solemnly tripping one after another, six personages, clad in white robes, wearing on their heads garlands of bays and golden vizards on their faces, branches of bays or palm in their hands. They first conge unto her, then dance, and at certain changes the first two hold a spare garland over her head, at which the other four make reverent curtsies. Then the two that held the garland deliver the same to the other next two, who observe the same order in their changes, and holding the garland over her head, which done, they deliver the same garland to the last two, who likewise observe the same order, at which, as it were by inspiration, she makes in her sleep signs of rejoicing, and holdeth up her hands to heaven, and so in their dancing vanish, carrying the garland with them. The music continues. Spirits of peace, where are ye? Are ye all gone? And leave me here in wretchedness behind ye. Madam, we are here. It is not you I call for. Saw ye none enter since I slept? None, madam. No? Saw you not even now a blessed troop invite me to a banquet, whose bright faces cast thousand beams upon me like the sun? They promised me eternal happiness, and brought me garlands, Griffith, which I feel I am not worthy yet to wear. I shall assuredly. I am most joyful, madam. Such good dreams possess your fancy. Bid the music leave. They are harsh and heavy to me. Music ceases. Do you note how much her grace is altered on the sudden? How long her face is drawn, how pale she looks, and of an earthy cold. Mark her eyes. She is going, wench. Pray, pray. 
Heaven comfort her. Enter a messenger. And like your grace. You are a saucy fellow. Deserve we no more reverence? You are to blame, knowing she will not lose her wanted greatness, to use so rude behavior. Go to, kneel. I humbly do entreat your highness pardon. My haste made me unmannerly. There is staying a gentleman sent from the king to see you. Admit him entrance, Griffith. But this fellow let me ne'er see again. Exund Griffith and messenger. Re-enter Griffith with Capusius. If my sight fail not, you should be lord ambassador from the emperor, my royal nephew, and your name Capucius. Madame, the same, your servant. Oh, my lord, the times and titles now are altered strangely with me since first you knew me. But I pray you, what is your pleasure with me? Noble lady, first mine own service to your grace, the next the king's request that I would visit you, who grieves much for your weakness, and by me sends you his princely commendations, and heartily entreats you take good comfort. Oh, my good lord, that comfort comes too late. Tis like a pardon after execution, that a gentle physic given in time had cured me. But now I am past the comfort here. But prayers, how does his highness? Madame, in good health. So may he ever do, and ever flourish, when I shall dwell with worms, and my poor name banished the kingdom. Patience, is that letter I caused you write yet sent away? No, madam. Giving it to Catherine. Sir, I most humbly pray you to deliver this to my lord the king. Most willing, madam. In which I have commended to his goodness the model of our chaste loves, his young daughter. The dews of heaven fall thick in blessings on her, beseeching him to give her virtuous breeding. She is young and of a noble, modest nature. I hope she will deserve well and a little to love her, for her mother's sake, that loved him heaven knows how dearly. My next poor petition is that his noble grace would have some pity upon my wretched women, that so long have followed both my fortunes faithfully, of which there is not one I dare avow, and now I should not lie, but will deserve for virtue and true beauty of the soul, for honesty and decent carriage, a right good husband, let him be a noble, and sure those men are happy that shall have him. The last is for my men. They are the poorest, but poverty could never draw em from me, that they may have their wages duly pay them, and something over to remember me by. If heaven had pleased to have given me longer life and able means, we had not parted thus. These are the whole contents— and good, my lord, by that you love the dearest in this world, as you wish Christian peace to souls departed, stand these poor people's friend, and urge the king to do me this last right. By heaven I will, or let me lose the fashion of a man. I thank you, honest lord. Remember me in all humility unto his highness. Say his long trouble now is passing out of this world. Tell him in death I blessed him, for so I will. Mine eyes grow dim. Farewell, my lord. Griffith, farewell. Nay, patience, you must not leave me yet. I must to bed. Call in more women. When I am dead, good wench, let me be used with honour. Strew me over with maiden flowers, that all the world may know I was a chaste wife to my grave. Embalm me, then lay me forth, although unqueened yet like a queen, and daughter to a king inter me. I can no more. Exeunt leading Catherine. End of Act Four. Act Five of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Henry the Eighth, Act Five. Scene One. London. A gallery in the palace. Enter Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, a page with a torch before him, met by Lavelle. It's one o'clock, boy, is it not? It hath struck. These should be hours for necessities, not for delights. Times to repair our nature with comforting repose, and not for us to waste these times. Good hour of the night, Sir Thomas. Whither so late? Came you from the king, my lord? I did, Sir Thomas, and left him at Primero with the Duke of Suffolk. I must to him, too, before he goes to bed. I'll take my leave. Not yet, Sir Thomas Lovell. What's the matter? It seems you are in haste, and if there be no great offence belongs to it, give your friend some touch of your late business. Affairs that walk, as they say spirits do at midnight, have in them a wilder nature than the business that seeks dispatch by day. My lord, I love you, and durst commend a secret to your ear, much weightier than this work. The queen's in labour, they say, in great extremity, and feared she'll with the labour end. The fruit she goes with I pray for heartily, that it may find good time and live. But for the stock, Sir Thomas, I wish it grubbed up now. Methinks I could cry the amen. And yet my conscience says she's a good creature, and, sweet lady, does deserve our better wishes. But, sir, sir, hear me, Sir Thomas. You're a gentleman of mine own way. I know you wise, religious. And let me tell you, it will ne'er be well. It will not, Sir Thomas Lovell, take it of me. Till Cranmer, Cromwell, her two hands, and she, sleep in their graves. Now, sir, you speak of two the most remarked in the kingdom. As for Cromwell, beside that of the jewel house is made master of the rolls, and the king's secretary. Further, sir, stands in the gap and trade of mo preferments, with which the time will load him. The archbishop is the king's hand and tongue, and who dare speak one syllable against him? Yes, yes, Sir Thomas, there are that dare, and I myself have ventured to speak my mind of him. And indeed, this day, sir, I may tell it you, I think I have incensed the lords of the council that he is, for so I know he is, they know he is, a most arch-heretic, a pestilence that does infect the land, with which they, moved, have broken with the king, who hath so far given ear to our complaint, of his great grace and princely care, foreseeing those fell mischiefs our reasons laid before him, hath commanded to-morrow morning to the council board he be convented, He's a rank weed, Sir Thomas, and we must root him out. From your affairs I hinder you too long. Good night, Sir Thomas. Many good nights, my lord. I rest your servant. Exeunt Gardiner and Page. Enter King Henry the Eighth and Suffolk. Charles, I will play no more to-night. My mind's not on't. You are too hard for me. Sir, I did never win of you before. But little, Charles nor shall not, when my fancy's on my play. Now, Lovell, from the Queen, what is the news? I could not personally deliver to her what you commanded me, but by her woman I sent your message, who returned her thanks in the greatest humbleness, and desired your Highness most heartily to pray for her. What sayst thou, huh? To pray for her? What? Is she crying out? So said her woman, and that her sufferance made almost each pang a death. Alas, good lady! God safely quit her of her burden, and with gentle travail to the gladding of your highness with an air. Tis midnight, Charles. Prithee to bed, and in thy prayers remember the estate of my poor queen. Leave me alone, for I must think of that which company would not be friendly to. I wish your highness a quiet night and my good mistress will remember in my prayers. Charles, good night. Exit Suffolk. Enter Denny. Well, sir, what follows? Sir, I have brought my lord the archbishop, as you commanded me. Ah, Canterbury? I, my good lord. Tis true. Where is he, Denny? He attends your highness' pleasure. Exit Denny. Aside. 
This is about that which the bishop spake. I am happily come hither. Re-enter Denny with Cranmer. Avoid the gallery. Lavelle seems to stay. Ah, I have said, be gone. What? Exunt Lavelle and Denny. Aside. I am fearful. Wherefore frowns he thus? Tis his aspect of terror. All's not well. How now, my lord, you desire to know wherefore I sent for you? Kneeling. It is my duty to attend your highness' pleasure. Pray you arise, my good and gracious lord of Canterbury. Come, you and I must walk a turn together. I have news to tell you. Come, come, give me your hand. Ah, my good lord, I grieve at what I speak, and am right sorry to repeat what follows. I have, and most unwillingly, of late heard many grievous, I do say, my lord, grievous complaints of you, which, being considered, have moved us and our counsel, that you shall this morning come before us, where I know you cannot with such freedom purge yourself, but that, till further trial in those charges, which will require your answer, you must take your patience to you, and be well contented to make your house our tower. You, a brother of us, it fits we thus proceed, or else no witness would come against you. Kneeling. I humbly thank your highness, and am right glad to catch this good occasion, most throughly to be winnowed, where my chaff and corn shall fly asunder, for I know there's none stands under more calumnious tongues than I myself, poor man. Stand up, good Canterbury, thy truth and thy integrity is rooted in us, thy friend. Give me thy hand, stand up. Prithee, let's walk. Now, by my holodam, what manner of man are you? My lord, I looked you would have given me your petition, that I should have obtain some pains to bring together yourself and your accusers, and to have heard you without endurance further. Most dread liege, the good I stand on is my truth and honesty. If they shall fail, I with mine enemies will triumph for my person which I weigh not, being of those virtues vacant. I fear nothing what can be said against me. Know you not how your state stands in the world with the whole world? Your enemies are many, and not small. Their practices must bear the same proportion, and not ever the justice and the truth of the question carries the due of the verdict with it. At what ease might corrupt minds procure knaves as corrupt to swear against you? Such things have been done. You are prudently opposed, and with a malice as of great size. When you have better luck, I mean in perjured witness, than your master, whose minister you are, whilst here he lived upon this naughty earth. Go to, go to, you take a precipice for no leap of danger, and woo your own destruction. God and your majesty protect mine innocence, or I fall into the trap is laid for me. Be of good cheer. They shall no more prevail than we give way to. Keep comfort to you, and this morning see you do appear before them. If they shall chance in charging you with matters to commit you, the best persuasions to the contrary fail not to use, and with what vehemency the occasion shall instruct you. If entreaties will render you no remedy, this ring deliver them, and your appeal to us there make before them. Look, the good man weeps. He's honest upon mine honour. God's blessed mother, I swear he is true-hearted, and a soul none better in my kingdom. Get you gone, and do as I bid you. Exit Cranmer. He has strangled his language in his tears. Enter old lady, Lavelle following. Within. Come back. What mean you? I'll not come back. The tidings that I bring will make my boldness manners. Now, good angels, fly o'er thy royal head, and shade thy person under their blessed wings. Now, by thy looks, I guess thy message. Is the queen delivered? Say I, and of a boy. Eh? Eh, my liege. And of a lovely boy, the God of heaven, both now and ever bless her. Tis a girl, 
promises boy hereafter sir your queen desires your visitation and to be acquainted with this stranger tis as like you as cherry is to cherry lovell sir give her a hundred marks i'll to the queen exit an hundred marks by this light i'll ha more an ordinary groom is for such payment i will have more or scold it out of him said i for this the girl was like to him i will have more or else unsay it and now while it is hot i'll put it to the issue exeunt scene two before the council chamber presuvians pages etc attending enter cranmer i hope i am not too late and yet the gentleman that was sent to me from the council prayed me to make great haste all fast what means this ho oh, who waits there sure you know me enter keeper yes my lord but yet i cannot help you why enter dr butts your grace must wait till you be called for so aside this is a piece of malice i am glad i came this way so happily the king shall understand it presently exit aside tis but the king's physician as he passed along how earnestly he cast his eyes upon me pray heaven he sound not my disgrace for certain this is of purpose laid by some that hate me god turn their hearts i never sought their malice to quench mine honour they would shame to make me wait else at door a fellow counsellor mong boys grooms and lackeys but their pleasures must be fulfilled and i attend with patience enter king henry the eighth and dr butts at a window above i'll show your grace the strangest sight what's that butts i think your highness saw this many a day body of me where is it there my lord the high promotion of his grace of canterbury who holds his state at door mongst pursuivants pages and footboys ah tis he indeed is this the honour they do one another tis well there's one above em yet i had thought they had parted so much honesty among em at least good manners as not thus to suffer a man of his place and so near our favour to dance attendance on their lordship's pleasures and at the door too like a post with packets by holy mary butts there's knavery let him alone and draw the curtain close we shall hear more anon exeunt scene three the council chamber enter chancellor places himself at the upper end of the table on the left hand, a seat being left and void above him, as for Cranmer's seat. Suffolk, Norfolk, Surrey, Chamberlain, and Gardiner seat themselves in order on each side. Cromwell at lower end as secretary. Keeper at the door. Speak to the business, Master Secretary. Why are we met in council? Please, Your Honours, the chief cause concern his Grace of Canterbury. Has he had knowledge of it? Yes. Who waits there? Without, my noble lords. Yes. My lord archbishop, and has done half an hour to know your pleasures. Let him come in. Your grace may enter now. Cranmer enters and approaches the council table. My good lord archbishop, I'm very sorry to sit here at this present and behold that chair stand empty but we all are men in our own natures frail and capable of our flesh few are angels out of which frailty and want of wisdom you that best should teach us have misdemeaned yourself and not a little toward the king first then his laws in filling the whole realm by your teaching and your chaplains for so we are informed with new opinions diverse and dangerous which are heresies and not reformed may prove pernicious which reformation must be sudden too my noble lords for those that tame wild horses pace em not in their hands to make em gentle 
but stop their mouths with stubborn bits and spur em till they obey the manage. If we suffer out of our easiness and childish pity to one man's honour this contagious sickness, farewell all physic, and what follows then? Commotions, uproars with a general taint of the whole state, as of late days our neighbours, the upper Germany, can dearly witness, yet freshly pitied in our memories. My good lords, hitherto in all the progress both of my life and office i have laboured and with no little study that my teaching and the strong course of my authority might go one way and safely and the end was ever to do well nor is there living i speak it with a single heart my lords a man that more detests more stirs against both in his private conscience and his place defacers of a public peace than i do pray heaven the king may never find a heart with less allegiance in it men that make envy and crooked malice nourishment dare bite the best I do beseech your lordships that in this case of justice my accusers, be what they will, may stand forth face to face and freely urge against me. Nay, my lord, that cannot be. You are a counsellor, and by that virtue no man dare accuse you. My lord, because we have business of more moment, we will be short with you. "'Tis his highness' pleasure, and our consent for better trial of you, from hence ye be committed to the tower, where, being but a private man again, you shall know many dare accuse you boldly, more than I fear you are provided for. "'Ah, my good lord of Winchester, I thank you. You are always my good friend. If your will pass, I shall both find your lordship judge and juror. You are so merciful. I see your end, tis my undoing. Love and meekness, Lord, become a churchman better than ambition. Win straying souls with modesty again, cast none away. That I shall clear myself, lay all the weight ye can upon my patience i make as little doubt as you do conscience in doing daily wrongs i could say more but reverence to your calling makes me modest my lord my lord you are a sectary that's the plain truth your painted gloss discovers to men that understand you words and weakness my lord of winchester you are a little by your good favour too sharp men so noble however faulty yet should find respect for what they have been tis a cruelty to load a falling man good master secretary i cry your honour mercy you may worst of all this table say so why my lord do not i know you for a favour of this new sect ye are not sound not sound not sound i say would you were half so honest men's prayers then would seek you not their fears i shall remember this bold language do remember your bold life too this is too much forbear for shame my lords i have done and i then thus for you my lord it stands agreed i take it by all voices that forthwith you be conveyed to the tower a prisoner there to remain till the king's further pleasure be known unto us. Are you all agreed, lords? We are. Is there no other way of mercy but I must needs to the tower, my lords? What other would you expect? You are strangely troublesome. Let some of the guard be ready there. Enter guard. For me, must I go like a traitor thither? receive him and see him safe in the tower stay good my lords i have a little yet to say look there my lords by virtue of that ring i take my cause out of the gripes of cruel men and give it to a most noble judge the king my master this is the king's ring tis no counterfeit 
"'Tis the right ring, by heaven! I told ye all, when ye first put this dangerous stone a-rolling, t'would fall upon ourselves. Do you think, my lords, the king will suffer by the little finger of this man to be vexed? Tis now too certain. How much more is his life in value with him? Would I were fairly out on't? My mind gave me, in seeking tales and informations, against this man, whose honesty the devil and his disciples only envy at. Ye blew the fires that burn ye. Now have at ye. Enter king, frowning on them, takes his seat. Dread sovereign, how much we are bound to heaven in daily thanks that gave us such a prince, not only good and wise, but most religious, one that in all obedience makes the church the chief aim of his honor, and to strengthen that holy duty out of dear respect, his royal self in judgment comes to hear the cause betwixt her and this great offender. You are ever good at sudden commendations, Bishop of Winchester. But no, I come not to hear such flattery now, and in my presence. They are too thin and bare to hide offences. To me you cannot reach. You play the spaniel, and think with wagging of your tongue to win me. But whatsoever thou takest me for, I'm sure thou hast a cruel nature and a bloody. To Cranmer. Good man, sit down. Now let me see the proudest, he that dares most, but wag his finger at thee. By all that's holy, he had better starve than but once think this place becomes thee not. May it please your grace. No, sir, it does not please me. I had thought I had had men of some understanding and wisdom of my counsel, but I find none. Was it discretion, lords, to let this man, this good man, few of you deserve that title, this honest man, wait like a lousy footboy at chamber door, and one as great as you are? Why, what a shame was this! Did my commission bid ye so far forget yourselves? I gave ye power, as he was a counsellor, to try him, not as a groom. The sum of ye, I see, more out of malice than integrity, would try him to the utmost, had ye mean, which ye shall never have while I live. Thus far, my most dread sovereign, may it like your grace to let my tongue excuse all. What was purposed concerning his imprisonment was rather, if there be faith in men, meant for his trial, and fair purgation to the world, than malice, I'm sure, in me. Well, well, my lord, respect him, take him, and use him well. He's worthy of it. I will say thus much for him, if a prince may be beholding to a subject, I am, for his love and service, so to him. Make me no more ado, but all embrace him. Be friends for shame, my lords. My lord of Canterbury, I have a suit which you must not deny me, that is, a fair young maid that yet wants baptism. You must be godfather, and answer for her. The greatest monarch now alive may glory in such an honour. How may I deserve it, that I'm a poor and humble subject to you? Come, come, my lord, you'd spare your spoons. You shall have two noble partners with you, the old Duchess of Norfolk and the Marquess Dorset. Will these please you? Once more, my lord of Winchester, I charge you, embrace and love this man. With a true heart and brother love I do it. And let heaven witness how dear I hold this confirmation. Good man, those joyful tears show thy true heart. The common voice I see is verified of thee, which says thus, Do my lord of Canterbury a shrewd turn, and he is your friend for ever. Come, lords, we trifle time away. I long to have this young one made a Christian. As I have made ye one, lords, one remain. So I grow stronger, you more honour gain. Exeunt. Scene four, the palace yard. Noise and tumult within. Enter Porter and his man. You leave your noise alone, you rascals. Do you take the court for Paris Garden? Ye rude slaves, leave your gaping. Within. Good master Porter, I belong to the larder. Belong to the gallows and be hanged, ye rogue. Is this a place to roar in? Fetch me a dozen crabtree staves and strong ones. 
these are but switches to em old scratch your heads you must be seeing christenings do you look for ale and cakes here you rude rascals pray sir be patient tis as much impossible unless we sweep em from the door with cannons to scatter em as tis to make em sleep on may-day morning which will never be we may as well push against powells as stir em ill got they in and be hanged alas i know not how gets the tide in as much as one sound cudgel of four foot you see the poor remainder could distribute i make no spare sir you did nothing sir i am not samson nor sir guy nor colbrant to mow em down before me but if i spared any that had a head to hit either young or old he or she cuckold or cuckold maker let me ne'er hope to see a chine again and that i would not for a cow god save her within do you hear master porter i shall be with you presently good master puppy keep the door closed sirrah what would you have me do what should you do but knock em down by the dozens is this more fields to muster in or have we some strange indian with a great tool come to court the women so besiege us bless me what a fry of fornication is at door on my christian conscience this one christening will beget a thousand here will be mother godfather and all together the spoons will be the bigger sir there is a fellow somewhat near the door he should be a brazier by his face for o oh my conscience twenty of the dog days now reign in snows all that stand about him are under the line they need no other penance that fire drake did i hit three times on the head and three times was his nose discharged against me he stands there like a mortar piece to blow us there was a haberdasher's wife of small wit near him that railed upon me till her pink porringer fell off her head for kindling such a combustion in the state i missed the meteor once and hit that woman who cried out clubs when i might see from far some forty truncheoners draw to her succor which were the hope of the strand where she was quartered they fell on i made good my place at length they came to the broomstaff to me i defied em still when suddenly a file of boys behind em loose shot delivered such a shower of pebbles that i was fain to draw mine honour in and let em win the work the devil was amongst them i think surely these are the ewes that thunder at a playhouse and fight for bitten apples that no audience but the tribulation of tower hill or the limbs of limehouse their dear brothers are able to endure i have some of them in limbo patrum and there they are like to dance these three days besides the running banquet of two beetles that is to come enter chamberlain mercy o me what a multitude are here they grow still too from all parts they are coming as if we kept a fair here where are these porters these lazy knaves you have made a fine hand fellows there's a trim rabble let in are all these your faithful friends of the suburbs we shall have great store of room no doubt left for the ladies when they pass back from the christening and please your honour we are but men and what so many may do not being torn to pieces we have done an army cannot rule em as i live if the king blame me for it i'll lay ye all by the heels and suddenly and on your heads clap round fines for neglect ye are lazy knaves and here ye lie baiting of bombards when ye should do service hark the trumpets sound they're come already from the christening go break among the press and find a way out to let the troop pass fairly or i'll find a marshalsea shall hold ye play these two months make way there for the princess you great fellow stand close up or i'll make your head ache you in the camlet get up o a rail i'll pick you all the pails else exeunt scene five the palace enter trumpets sounding then two aldermen lord mayor garter cranmer norfolk with his marshal's staff suffolk two noblemen bearing great standing bowls for the christening gifts then four noblemen bearing a canopy under which the duchess of norfolk godmother bearing the child richly habited in a mantle etc train borne by a lady then follows the marchioness dorset 
the other godmother and ladies. The troop pass once about the stage, and Garter speaks. Heaven, from thy endless goodness, send prosperous life, long and ever happy, to the high and mighty princess of England, Elizabeth. Flourish. Enter King Henry the Eighth and guard. Kneeling. And to your royal grace and the good queen, my noble partners and myself thus pray. All comfort, joy, in this most gracious lady, heaven ever laid up to make parents happy, may hourly fall upon ye. Thank you, good Lord Archbishop. What is her name? Elizabeth. Stand up, Lord. King Henry the Eighth kisses the child. With this kiss take my blessing. God protect thee, into whose hand I give thy life. Amen. My noble gossips, ye have been too prodigal. I thank ye heartily. So shall this lady, when she has so much English. Let me speak, sir, for heaven now bids me. And the words I utter let none think flattery, for they'll find em truth. This royal infant, heaven still move about her though in her cradle yet now promises upon this land a thousand thousand blessings which time shall bring to ripeness she shall be but few now living can behold that goodness a pattern to all princes living with her and all that shall succeed saba was never more covetous of wisdom and fair virtue than this pure soul shall be all princely graces that mould up such a mighty peace as this is with all the virtues that attend the good shall still be doubled on her truth shall nurse her holy and heavenly thoughts still counsel her she shall be loved and feared her own shall bless her her foes shake like a field of beaten corn and hang their heads with sorrow good grows with her in her days every man shall eat in safety under his own vine what he plants and sing the merry songs of peace to all his neighbours god shall be truly known and those about her from her shall read the perfect ways of honour and by those claim their greatness not by blood nor shall this peace sleep with her but as when the bird of wonder dies the maiden phoenix her ashes new create another heir as great in admiration as herself so shall she leave her blessedness to one when heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness who from the sacred ashes of her honour shall star-like rise as great in fame as she was and so stand fixed peace plenty love truth terror that were the servants to this chosen infant shall then be his and like a vine grow to him wherever the bright sun of heaven shall shine his honour and the greatness of his name shall be and make new nations he shall flourish and like a mountain cedar reach his branches to all the plains about him our children's children shall see this and bless heaven thou speakest wonders she shall be to the happiness of england an aged princess many days shall see her and yet no day without a deed to crown it would i had known no more but she must die she must the saints must have her yet a virgin a most unspotted lily shall she pass to the ground and all the world shall mourn her. 
O Lord Archbishop, thou hast made me now a man. Never before, this happy child, did I get anything this oracle of comfort has so pleased me, that when I am in heaven I shall desire to see what this child does, and praise my maker. I thank ye all. To you, my good Lord Mayor, and your good brethren, I am much beholding. I have received much honour by your presence, and ye shall find me thankful. Lead the way, lords. Ye must all see the Queen, and she must thank ye. She will be sick else. This day no man think has business at his house, for all shall stay. This little one shall make it holiday. Exeunt. Apologue. Tis ten to one this play can never please all that are here. Some come to take their ease and sleep an act or two. But those we fear we have frighted with our trumpets, so tis clear they'll say tis naught. Others to hear the city abused extremely, and to cry, that's witty, which we have not done neither. That, I fear, all the expected good we're like to hear for this play at this time is only in the merciful construction of good women, for such a one we showed em. If they smile and say twill do, I know within a while all the best men are ours, for tis ill hap if they hold when their ladies bid em clap. End of Act 5 End of Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare